an additional 300 million euros. And uh, also there was another stimulus package. So that's basically the conjunctural and, and future package, which gave another 2 billion euros for quantum technologies. So that's kind of lots of money in the game here. And you'll see that actually what was uh, the, the, the big, what it triggered was a big momentum in this field. And this is what I want to describe in a little bit more in uh, going into a, a closer details. So what has happened? A few projects have already started. And these projects, they are for building quantum processes and technologies for quantum computers. And basically all the uh, platforms that we are currently thinking could be, be best suited for a quantum computer are actually represented. There is projects on entangled photons here led by the TU Munich cubic. There is projects on ultra cold atoms where you store atoms in 2D structures in lattices, use the Rydberg states to make qubit gates uh, between them. There is the well known iron traps, um, which get, got two projects funded uh, here in the HF control trapped ions or in small registers of ions and shuttling. There's also projects clearly superconducting qubits, which I'm very proud of that we are also part of rule one in these. So we are uh, leading one of these projects and clearly also semiconducting qubits. So with this, the aim here is to build demonstrator to improve on the qualities to show specific aspects of quantum processes. Another project that has been started or another uh, grant uh, proposal round is along algorithms, software and applications. And we see here different applications, different um, projects, for example, on error mitigation, but also on applied reinforcement learning for industrial applications. So the idea is actually to, and that we will also see them later on, is to have these two streams. First, we want to invest here into exploring what are useful applications. And the other thing is exploring how can we build, how can we contribute, how can we actually um, built the technology for quantum computing, but also quantum sensors. So the whole range of quantum applications also from the hardware side. The most exciting thing came then with this 2 billion stimulus package for quantum technologies. And there the goal was, which was written there, is uh, that Germany should be competitive, should become competitive on an international level in the most significant uh, um, directions in quantum technologies, both on the economic, but also on the technological side. So that means there should be the excellence in research should actually lead to a transfer of technology into the companies, into startups, and to um, in combination of these as a merger between science and industry, form real new, new clusters and new ways, actually um, new collaborations to foster quantum technologies in general. So the goal is enable Germany to become a world leader in quantum technologies by establishing strong links between science and industry. It's what was recognized that science alone won't do it, industry alone won't do it. So it's this combination of both worlds that actually will, um, is the vision to uh, have to be successful in. So it started in October with an expert panel within the industry and academic members that have been installed. And then four months later, the roadmap, it was a tight schedule, has then been presented to Bundeskanzler Merkel. And the roadmap was basically then followed, and I will soon uh, come back to what is in these recommendations of this expert panel and what has been realized so far, led them to calls that have been announced between March and May. And in September, the first projects have been accepted and it's planned that they, those will start in January. So what is it about? The point is that one should establish hubs, hubs as the centers for quantum technologies that focus on one or more quantum platforms that focus actually on the full stack quantum computing to establish this technology um, and then build working devices. There can be many of those and those should be linked by networks networks in the different areas, for example, education, application, or infrastructure. So a bit more in, in detail. This is all along the lines of the main goal, goal to establish sovereign quantum computing technology or quantum technology in general, along the hardware and the applications direction. 
So in five years, the goal would be to reach to the 100 qubit level with the potential for further scaling up. Five to 10 years, application-ready quantum processes should be reached. And clearly the long term is that we want to have this universal quantum computer that can then solve all of the problems uh, that can be more efficiently solved on a quantum computer. The second main topic is provide existing quantum computers for applications. So not only to build them, but clearly use now what is existing to leverage also and to dig into this quantum world more deeply to know what it's about. And that's in particular interesting also for science, but also for industry and, and commercial uh, share, uh, stakeholders. What are these hubs? As mentioned, they should be vertically integrated uh, centers. So from bottom, from the quantum hardware to the software stack, they should enable tech transfer from science into industry. And while they should focus on established quantum computing systems to just build this technology, to know how to build quantum computers, but also explore alternative technologies. In these hubs, there should be a combination of research, industry, and startups to, because it became, becomes clear that there needs to be industrialization afterwards. It cannot be a mere uh, science and research goal. And then after five years, there should be an evaluation. There should be also a competitive aspect in these hubs. The connecting, um, the connecting networks, these are based on the overarching topics to connect between the hubs. That means the uh, recommendation was to establish application networks to explore industry relevant use cases and to provide access to existing quantum computers. And infrastructure networks, so most essential infrastructure like pilot lines for fabrication or for um, building specific components, these should be coordinated at best uh, being even an, an open access model so that partners can actually use this infrastructure. An education network that's very important because it was also clear that one needs to educate experts, both for industry and research, to, so that these uh, goals can be reached and so that Germany becomes attractive at an international level. The industrialization network, that means here technology transfer should be actually fostered across Germany. Startups and industry should be integrated uh, to, to work towards this common goal. And another recommendation was to build an umbrella organization, which shouldn't be uh, very heavy, it should be light and unbureaucratic, which could, should coordinate these efforts and ensure that everything goes in the same, uh, in the right direction. So with this recommendation, there has already been the first funding schemes out and the first uh, fundings, uh, the, the first projects being rolled out. And that's, for example, for uh, innovative um, research uh, infrastructure. That there is a few, um, a few projects now, for example, on single photon detectors or on fiber technology. There's also now projects, another call about enabling technologies for quantum technologies. So interface elements or frequency converters or photon sources. All of them with research and science partners, uh, science and industry partners. The other consortia, the other calls that have been out were along this education network, network inter, uh, of interdisciplinary um, education concepts in quantum technology with the goal to train quantum experts. And there the call is closed. And uh, as far as I know, the consortia should be announced uh, soon. And there is also what I mentioned this application network, which, is, which has the goal to develop practical quantum algorithms. And also there, that has been called calls uh, out, and uh, consortia has been selected and will be announced. That's ongoing. As for the hubs, there was then a, a, a call announcement uh, by um, May this year. That's about quantum computer demonstration platforms to develop quantum computing technologies and platforms towards its prospective hubs. And here, clearly, uh, that's not uh, official yet. It's um, maybe a, a non-exhaustive list. The funding needs to be confirmed, so that's uh, taken with a grain of salt. But that's uh, the, the current uh, status uh, that I'm aware of. So it means we will see most likely different uh, centers, different quantum projects formed in different places, 
may some of them or many of them this delocalized but uh, with main centers here in the lower section the quantum valley around hanover in Zurich, focusing on superconducting qubits there is one in stuttgart focusing on photo photonic systems in freiburg and spin systems there is in munich qc um, about uh, superconducting qubits atoms and ions and there will be dlr quantum centers and so we we hope that these all uh, will um, will will be realized soon, so that the whole uh, momentum will be kept on uh, towards this quantum computer. What needs to be mentioned as well is this industry initiatives. So we have seen earlier this year that Fraunhofer and IBM has a collaboration which provides quantum computing power to German science and industry partners via IBM System One. And that's very important because it fosters, it, it keeps this link between the, the industry and the science. So, and provides access to early systems. For example, BMW has sponsored a chair at the TUM for quantum algorithms and application. So that's also, again, shows that there is science and industry working together in the same direction. There is QTAG founded by leading industry partners, like many DAX uh, uh, companies like BMW, Infineon, Siemens, ESF to identify, develop, test, and share quantum applications. And also Trump, for example, invested in the subsidiary uh, quant to developing chips for photonic quantum computers. And that's basically a, a list of different industry initiatives showing actually that it's all going into this direction with that there's a huge momentum in the field. Now, what I want to show is that there is a specific focus what we are planning here in Germany, because it's not only these federal initiatives, it's also the uh, local initiatives that we are seeing here in Bavaria. We have um, the Munich Quantum Valley that has been established earlier this year, which has, this, uh, as, uh, which has the goal to establish a center for quantum computing and quantum technologies to bring together science and industry. And that's a Bavarian initiative. And here the task is we want to realize and operate a quantum computer system. We want to develop quantum algorithms and applications. We want to support enabling quantum technologies and foundation of a vibrant startup environment and the quantum ecosystem, and also strengthen the education, professional development, and outreach activities. So what are the effects? It is uh, founded by uh, five uh, in institute institutions, the Bavarian Academy of Sciences, the Fraunhofer Society, the LMU, the Max Planck Society, and the Technical University of Munich. It is led by Professor Rainer Blatt from University of Innsbruck. And we have a budget of 300 million euros. And the runtime in two phases is between 21 and 26. And that's also separate in a year, uh, three years and two years phase. And, but it's intended to actually last longer because it's also um, uh, commonly so it is everybody's aware of that it's also a mid to long term project. There will be a, a registered association and we have different consortia where we have a goal driven development of quantum computing systems. There is also not only this quantum computing, but it's also basic research and enabling technologies, which is important. And these will be focusing, this will become in terms of lighthouse projects. There will be research professorships. Um, there will be a call out there for supporting and complementing existing expertise and quantum science and technology education and outreach to train quantum specialists and reach out to the broader public and also a technology park and an entrepreneurship center to foster industrialization. So that's the whole concept with different partners which are spread not only in Munich, but all over Bavaria. That's what's shown in this graph. So it's not a Munich only center. It is also, we want to establish and have established close links to industries and startups, also to the German quantum community, to also these other um, uh, hubs and centers that are currently forming, to different German-wide BMBF projects, like uh, these quantum computer demonstration um, aufbauten that I mentioned before in the future, like education networks, but also to European project. That's very important. It shouldn't be a German alone initiative. 
but making links to quantum flagship projects or other fed open projects or training networks is um, very is essential. So where are we at the moment? We got the okay to get uh, to get going for um, uh, since since October, and so we're in the setup and development stage. The plan is to have quantum computer demonstrators uh, within the next uh, three years to come, and then go on for NISC type quantum computers with more qubits. And that will also in this first phase will do hardware software engineering and make progress in the quantum technology parts so that we then on can develop error corrected universal quantum computers. Briefly, Lycos project. I mentioned that it's more on the, uh, from the bottom up approach. So supporting quantum technologies should be in these Lycos projects. They build on innovation and excellence in science. They should attract talents for science, research centers and industry. And it's ambitious for very wide projects. Topics can be quantum metrology, alternative hardware platforms, simulators, networks, sensors. It could be a whole stack. I don't want to go through all these details here, but we have uh, basic platforms. One is superconnecting qubits, and the other one is atoms and ions. And from there on, building the full stack until we reach these user applications. Briefly, what are these platforms? Superconnecting qubits, trapped ions, and neutral atoms. What I'm interested in is building quantum processors um, from superconducting qubits. These are um, quantized nonlinear superconducting circuits. The advantage is us, we have fast gate operations within a few nanoseconds, high fidelity gate operations. They can be stable and also the fabrication is scalable. And clearly we, we have heard probably many times, there is also challenges around reproducibility, quantum classical crosstalk or interface purity. The, research, the, the partners here I should mention, I want to mention is uh, the Fraunhofer. We have the FAU, we have Karl, uh, we have uh, the Leibniz Institute, we have the LRC, the TU Munich, and the uh, WMI. And also industry partners like Infineon, IQM, QUTRA, Parity QC, Cruz, Zurich Instruments. And there is two directions. One is scaling up, up scaling systems up. And one is innovation, so building better systems, better qubits, uh, better connectivities. The second platform, trapped ions. Here we have qubits based on trapped calcium ions. These are manipulated by laser pulses, coherence times of more than 100 milliseconds, and high gate fidelities, and uptime of hours and days. And the big advantage is that all these qubits are identical by nature, which facilitates, facilitates the fabrication. Main challenges, the scalable realizations of high performance segmented traps, and also to integrate optics and electronics into traps. Last but not least, neutral atoms. The goal is also here to build quantum processors that are scalable to more than 100 qubits. They are built on strontium atoms, neutral strontium atoms, identical qubits based on transitions in optically trapped, in, uh, which are optically trapped, the atoms. Flexible qubits, the ranges, the frequency range goes from optical uh, to, to megahertz. Flexible 2D connectivity, so you can implement different graphs, which makes it uh, quite uh, interesting for quantum computing and simulations. Qubit lifetimes of many seconds and gates via strong readback interactions. The main challenge is here fast single qubit gates, reduction of optical crosstalk, and also to increase the technology readiness level will be the next. Uh, steps to go. With this, I want to finish. I want to mention there's now lots of quantum dynamics going on in Germany. I showed a few examples what's going on at the federal level, focused on the Munich Quantum Valley where I'm um, working in, and thanks for your attention. Thanks a lot, Stefan, for your very insightful talk. And clearly it also was an inspirational talk we, because we already have a couple of questions um, in the chat. So I'll just go to the first one, um, which is that it seems that there are a lot of stakeholders in Germany and the structure of this German quantum network is quite complex. What would you say are the main challenges Germany must face for this network to be successful? And 
whether a simpler or smaller network may seem more convenient in certain aspects and whether you could also comment on that. So it's two questions. So for the first one is maybe on kind of with this complex network, how could Germany, what do they have to do to be successful? So for this, uh, there's different consortia and all these consortia focus on one or two platforms. So as, uh, I think I would say this complexity is broken down into different entities. The question is actually how this all um, works together and that's indeed um, a more tricky part. But I guess the more we get going and see what different kind of expertise we can tie in, for example, in the Munich Quantum Valley, having ties to, to Ulrich, for example, to other superconducting qubit activities. That's not a we go alone effort and the competitors uh, we leave, uh, leave out. But it's more like a consolidated effort with different um, uh, different centers or different consortia forming. And a smaller network, yeah, okay, I think I answered basically this question. Yeah, yeah. So, so I take from it also that sort of it might seem complex at the side of it, but actually there's consolidation going on below in a way. And, and, and that will necessarily happen, uh, that there is consolidation forming, there will be different expertise will build up at different places, and there's also there is a competitive character, uh, so that one can see then who, who has the best technology and uh, who, who will go on with that. Yeah, okay, thanks. And then there was a question, you presented the Munich Quantum Valley. Um, and the question is how that fits into the bigger picture of um, the German quantum technology networks. So the Munich quantum valley is basically a, a, a hub, a center where we have these three platforms. And as mentioned, it fits into this bigger picture in that we are collaborating with, with also the others. We are one of these centers bringing forward the vertical stack of a quantum computer. And um, so we are one part of the, uh, the German activities and the, the German quantum computing initiatives. Okay. And then an attendee is asking about if they wanted to learn more about the German quantum roadmap, where could they find out more? Is there some references you can point them to? Uh, yes, there is a link to the German quantum roadmap to this paper. And uh, the other one is basically the, the many calls and the many initiatives uh, that are coming out. Um, I don't, okay, there, I can provide a link to these. Okay, great, thanks. And then given that we're the industry days in Switzerland, we of course have a question with a Swiss perspective as well, which is that whether there's any possibility of collaboration um, between companies or institutions from Switzerland with the initiatives such as the Munich Quantum Valley, for example, or the broader network that you were speaking about. Um, that I think I cannot answer in which call this goes. I mean, that's definitely uh, will work. I also, I mean, I don't, okay. There is, I think also on the political level, there is some um, dynamics going on to bring also DAC or European countries together in bilateral networks and also with Switzerland. Um, but uh, so Switzerland can, uh, we can have associated partners from Switzerland and within the current networks, um, that's basically collaboration we, we would like to encourage, yes. Okay, um, so maybe to close with a kind of technology focused question, someone is asking um, that from your presentation, they had the impression that there's not so much interest or focus on room temperature quantum computers based on photonics, which have their own advantages. Um, or is that right? Do they, are they right with that impression or is that under discussion? Is what no, asking. that's actually not correct. Maybe I didn't focus this enough. There is one quantum demonstrator project uh, specifically on, on uh, photonic systems. Uh, there is also companies like, like Trump very much interested. There is university groups uh, like um, Stephanie Barth, Christine Silberhorn, they are very active in this photonics community. And I think uh, uh, Fraunhofer, I, now I leave out many of those I should now mention, but there's lots of dynamics going on in this photonics direction. And there, is, mm -hmm. there will be also many projects on these. Okay, great. Excellent. Um, thanks a lot, Stefan. Um, we're right on time. Thank you very much for this overview, which I think kicked us off very well um, in the session here. Um, so I'd like, now like to introduce uh, Sabrina, 
Uh, Sabrina Maniscalco is a professor at con uh, of quantum information and logic at the University of Helsinki and professor at Aalto University, both in Finland, of course, as well. She's also the vice director of the Finnish Center of Excellence for Quantum Technologies and the vice director for education of the Institute Q. And she's also, as if that wouldn't stop, the CEO and co-founder of Algorithmic, a startup that focuses on quantum algorithms and software. And she um, holds a PhD from the University of Palermo. And as you can imagine, Sabrina will speak now about bridging academia, industry, and society. We're very excited to have you, Sabrina. And with that, I'll give the floor to you and just remind our participants that you can ask your questions in the Q&A and we'll, we'll have a chance to ask them to Sabrina. Thank you very much. Um, uh, first of all, uh, thanks a lot for the invitation. I'm very glad and happy to be here and to talk about this topic, which is, of course, uh, clearly at my heart. Uh, and I will uh, do so um, after skipping my introduction because <laughs> it was very well done. Thank you, Mira, for that. Um, by talking about a little bit about um, the history uh, of a project that I would like to share with you, because I think it's a very nice experience uh, and a very nice example of bridging academia, uh, society, uh, and uh, companies. And this is Kubelay Learn. Kubelay Learn was the result of several years uh, of uh, um, passion, really, for outreach, outreach and education, which started when in 2014 we initiated the very first quantum game jam. Since then, and nowadays there are so many quantum game jams, these are um, ways of exploring in an innovative way quantum physics. And it will become clearer during my talk why I'm, I'm starting with through this perspective, which is a perspective very different um, compared to standard uh, way of discussing about quantum physics. Uh, we we uh, proceeded in my group by um, a number of science and art projects, uh, including a quantum circus that was a performance uh, of artists and quantum physicists. Uh, and, uh, over the years, as we uh, experienced uh, really on our um, on our skin um, in a very passionate way, uh, the, the interaction um, between uh, quantum physicists uh, and the general public, uh, including schools, educators, uh, and then eventually companies, uh, we decided to bring all together, forming uh, Qplay Learn. And I would like to talk uh, of Qplay Learn to give an example uh, of, of such a um, bridge, building such a bridge. So I'm telling you. Really Really, uh, in a way, a personal story. What is Qplay Learn? So, Qplay Learn is a, an online platform containing multimedia resources, so a variety of, of approaches for learning about quantum science and technologies in a playful way. And here I will stress the word playful, it will come back very often. There is a very deep meaning behind this. Um, we, we do have a mission uh, in Qplay Learn, and this is to provide multi-level education on quantum science and technologies to everyone, regardless of their age and background. Of course, it doesn't mean that the approach is the same for everyone. We have different levels for different audiences, and there are clearly different nuances. And obviously, every tool uh, is... is uh, strictly and closely linked to the audience we have. But our mission is very general because we believe that um, anyone can understand the beauty of quantum physics and the power of quantum technologies. We are not saying that anyone, everyone should become an expert in quantum technology, but we are saying that there are different degrees to which we can communicate uh, such an important topics uh, nowadays uh, without becoming quantum physicists, which is of course also something important, but it's not for everyone. So we, we have developed, um, in order to do so, an innovative method uh, which invites people to understand the quantum world in a fun, supportive and visionary way. And I want to introduce the team because I believe this is, this is very important um, to understand uh, the effort we are putting uh, into this. Uh, what we are trying to do is I really uh, honestly think building a new framework and a new language, because despite the, mention, uh, the mentioning to the playfulness before, we really take quantum uh, outreach and education and retraining very seriously. Uh, and the team that you see here behind the Qplay Learner is a team, all of us has a PhD in quantum physics. Um, there are two professors with extensive experience in outreach and education, myself and Marilu Kiofalo, who is the director of Discovery. 
Caterina Foti is the direct, director of QPlay Learn, a quantum physicist herself, with several years of experience in outreach, and nowadays the outreach coordinator of Institute Q. Uh, and then three postdocs, Matteo Rossi, Guillermo Ortega Perez, and Boris Sokolov. Our fantastic director of Im image, which is uh, Rada Piari Sandiren, and she's also a quantum physicist with um, a passion for uh, storytelling and writing. She's a very creative person. And the only, um, let's say, uh, non quantum physicist is Rosario, who has a PhD in education, has worked many years in work groups in the European Commission, uh, specifically focused on European policies uh, on education and, and uh, adult learning education in particular. He is the director of digital learning. Now, the approach of, of QPlay Learn is, um, as I said before, we believe quite different because we uh, believe that it is needed a holistic perspective which stems from the recognition that different types of intelligence dominate the learning proper processes of each, each individual. So each of us think in different ways. We scientists very often have a dominant logical or mathematical way of thinking, but many other people may have a more uh, kinetic aesthetic way of thinking, they may, some other people, and, I, and now I'm referring really to, for example, our experience with the uh, quantum circle students who are thinking really with their head and with their body. Uh, other people may have a more visual way of thinking. So how do we reach everyone in a way that is closest to their own way of thinking, not just our own uh, as scientists? And for doing this, we um, have developed this, this, uh, this approach which uh, allows to build intuition and engagement through games and videos, understand physical concepts through easy to follow, but importantly, scientifically accurate description. And I will stress here scientifically accurate because really everything we do passes through the very careful scrutiny of all this the quantum physicist theme. So we, we really think a lot how to find the best compromise in expressing the language through metaphors, through visual images, uh, in a way that is, is as close as possible to what is scientifically accurate, even if we don't use always mathematics. And of course, then we also explain abstract concepts through mathematics if you want to reach this level. So there are different levels. Uh, it's a multi-layered ways of explaining um, quantum science and technology. Technologies. And that's why we initiated our adventure in QPlay Learn um, by um, uh, identifying these three uh, independent um, uh, but connected uh, uh, pillars in a way. The first one is play, through which um, we, we build the intuition and experience. Discover, which is the stage of conceptualization where we expose the learner to an experiment explained in simple way by a physics experiment which allows him to understand or start building the main concepts of physics. And then the formalization uh, abs abstraction uh, is the part uh, of learn, the learn stage, where we also introduce the mathematics. Uh, and now we uh, added to this uh, um, scenario the uh, um, apply and imagine sections. Apply is for programming, in particular programming quantum computers, and this has been done in collaboration with the startup Strangeworks, uh, and um, eventually imagine, this is a very new baby uh, of QPlay Learn, uh, where we are completely and fully exposing to creativity through science and art and storytelling. So uh, QPlay Learn, uh, the, the role really of QPlay Learn is to build connections between academia, companies, schools, and citizens. So it's a container uh, of uh, products um, that we organize uh, and, and um, curate uh, in, in a very careful manner. Uh, in academia, of course, uh, some of the major players involved in QPlay Learn are our, are our Center of Excellence for Quantum Technologies, as well as Institute Q, the Finnish National Institute for Quantum Technologies. But we do work in collaboration with very many quantum physicists from all over the world that are all contributing to the development of quantum technologies. And of course, via our quantum game jams, many students are also encouraged to play, create game, uh, and contribute uh, to quantum education. Um, the, the, on the other hand, we also offer in QPlay Learn some tools for academia. In particular, you will find several um, uh, videos, uh, interviews, uh, um, cartoons, animations, uh, and uh, a, a number of uh, multidisciplinary um, um, 
tools really uh, to complement the standard classes uh, at the, even at the university level um, by means of these multimedia resources that we that we offer um, in Hubley Learn. Then when it comes to companies, uh, we um, are, are proposing to apply our, um, our method to speed up the learning process uh, of the company's teams uh, with, um, by means of uh, a dedicated course. I will explain as soon as we show you an example of the course we offer uh, for retraining of companies. So this is actually something that we offer for, for as a tool uh, that is very important for the ecosystem, in particular for companies where um, it is necessary uh, for certain um, for certain uh, employees um, to gain the knowledge uh, of, of quantum physics. It could be even executives. Okay. So what what do we uh, offer? Um, our, our first um, offer, uh, which is available already today, it is Inspiration Quantum. So Inspiration Quantum, I think I have a short. Um, uh, overview of inspiration quantum here uh, and this is really aimed at introducing uh, what is quantum technologies but especially trying to um, show how to read critically the media and understand or distinguish the hype for what is actually scientifically accurate so we use our approach in order to learn or to teach in this case the basics in a way that does not use however any math mathematics but but gives you the tool uh, to read some critical and understand really from if when you read a newspaper article uh, is this actually uh, something that is uh, you know scientifically accurate how can I build um, a proper critical um, critical way of thinking in the framework of, of quantum computing it is uh, a course that is um, um, possible to follow on any device so you can use your mobile phone you can use your iPad it uses the quantum pills so there are some videos and animations it uses several interviews with experts in quantum information theory uh, from all over the world for explaining the basic um, concepts of quantum physics uh, and it uses at the same time um, also uh, obviously a quiz uh, and uh, an interactive approach uh, so that in general um, it, it is it is not just uh, um, in a way the uh, a way of, of uh, you know absorbing concepts but is a way of interacting uh, through them uh, to learn so this is uh, the offering one of the offering for companies uh, but we also have uh, targeted we have developed targeted uh, um, targeted tools uh, for uh, schools and citizens at large of course actually there are differences between what we do and what, how we collaborate uh, for developing education in high schools and, and what we do for public outreach but i will show you here two examples that can be um, used in both okay so the here, here the basic is really to engage students with online games but also with other material in order to introduce the concept of quantum mechanics as much as possible in an intuitive way and this is a way in which we support high school teachers uh, in innovating uh, their teaching methods and therefore of course our main aim in this case is to increase the students engagement but also at the same time um, to increase the understanding and the communication for the main aspects um, of quantum physics and I will show you here a trailer. Uh, let's see, probably you should be able also to, uh, to hear uh, the sound. It's a very short trailer.
the trailer of the photonic trail, uh, which is uh, the first of the product of imaging, so coordinated by RADA, I mentioned before, uh, in collaboration with artist uh, um, Sibel Cantola. Uh, the photonic trail is a quantum optic treasure hunt, and it is really an immersive single player game uh, that allow you to, to start an adventure. And it combines uh, really an interesting uh, um, lab that is the one developed by a quantum fly trap with fantastic uh, beautifully written storytelling and with dedicated drawings that accompany the story so it is a mission uh, and in particular you will see it is freely available from the qplay learn um, platform uh, and uh, it is uh, simple as i said before it's part of imaging so it is our first product in imaging which is this environment without any uh, any restrictions uh, and um, from the page of, uh, of uh, imaging you will also see um, how to begin um, playing uh, the photonic trail so you will uh, you will see that there are um, several uh, several layers uh, there are several missions and you start from the first mission and you start with a beautiful story uh, that takes you uh, into this uh, fantastic world um, where you uh, the first the first mission is in the party haven uh, and uh, through this uh, storytelling uh, and through this uh, interactive uh, uh, way of learning uh, you will discover and you will be um, somehow guided, your interest will be guided towards uh, what is uh, um, the main elements of quantum optics of a real laboratory simulation, which is provided then because this was done in collaboration with quantum flight trap. So there is a mission, you will be um, asked to solve a puzzle and the puzzle involves learning how to place certain elements uh, of, um, of quantum optics in order to uh, solve the mission. Uh, and again, the mission is related to the story, so it's all connected uh, to, through this uh, underlying story. Uh, and therefore, in a way, it is very engaging and demystifies or allows not to be afraid, actually, of the quantum physics uh, concepts. So then eventually, you have to submit your answer. And if you uh, guess right, you can go to the second part uh, or the second part of the challenge, which is the second, uh, um, the second experience, the second puzzle, the second uh, mystery. And you follow these until you solve uh, the, the mystery of the treasure hunt. So this is just an example of a tool uh, that can be used in schools, but it can also be used uh, for public outreach. Um, uh, then, uh, the, uh, in general, this, uh, um, the, the idea of, of, um, of the um, of, of QPlay Learn uh, is uh, not only to have experiences like the quantum fly trap, but to provide uh, what we call uh, a quantum dictionary. We call it Quest. It's really a quantum dictionary which involves the main concepts. It's an uh, ever growing dictionary. Uh, the next entry will be on quantum thermodynamics. So it's an ever going uh, dictionary uh, in which, for each of the uh, topics, uh, quantum state, qubit, quantum superposition, you will find games, you will find uh, explanations you will find all the different stages, uh, including videos, interviews to experts where they explain, uh, like if they are talking to their uh, grandparents, um, and also uh, quantum pills, that are these beautiful animations that we have created uh, together with, um, with a startup um, specialized uh, in uh, public outreach, that is VIS, it's a spin-off of uh, Scuola Normale Superiore. Uh, and finally, not finally, but another example uh, that I want to give um, of uh, um, an innovative way uh, of uh, teaching uh, quantum physics, in particular, in this case, quantum computing, uh, that I have been personally using, for example, in my uh, quantum information course in the University of Helsinki, uh, but uh, it has been also used uh, in, in workshops, and it is not just aimed um, at, um, at, at um, let's say, students with a background in quantum physics, but the, the nice and uh, interesting part is that it can be used really also with people who have no experience uh, on quantum. And this is uh, Cue Cards Online. Cue Cards was a, is a game that was born uh, in, a, in a quantum game jam initially um, uh, in 2019. It's a quantum game jam organized together with IBM uh, in Helsinki. Uh, the Quantum Wheel was the uh, name of, of, the, of the game jam. And I was actually in the team. Um, I was one of the organizers, of course, of this quantum game jam, but I was also in the Cue Cards team. Uh, and using this 
uh, during the, the, uh, the jam, uh, we came up with a card game uh, that eventually led to the first version of two cards and finally was continued into, into what is now a fully uh, online mobile game. You see here on the right um, the, 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 the app from where you can find it from uh, uh, Apple Store or, or um, Google Play, it's called Q Cards Online, uh, and uh, allows to uh, learn or to really, in a way, to learn how the, the action of, of quantum gates, so how to program, uh, in a way, quantum computers. Uh, and here are some screenshots from Q Cards. Um, first question is, have you ever played a game on a quantum computer? Why this question? Because actually Q Cards uses a, a real IBM quantum computer. So the, the each game uh, is interfaced with uh, an IBM quantum computer and therefore the, uh, eventually the circuits are run on the IBM quantum computers. So it's a multi invite friends because it's a multiplayer game. It can be played, of course, uh, on the mobile phone and you will have different cards which corresponds to different uh, logic gates, uh, X, identity, Hadamard and so on. So there are uh, up to five players can play at the same time. Uh, and, um, uh, well, obviously they just have, have to insert their name and start playing. This is how the layout looks like. So they are given a hands of cards, uh, X, Y, Hadamard and so on. And the idea is that they start all from, uh, all the players start with a qubit in zero. And at the end of the, um, of the game, they have to maximize the probability by applying gates that they're, they're themselves, their player, like Anna in this case, has um, flipped the qubit to one. And they can play their cards on their own line or uh, against others, on the lines of others. There are also uh, two qubit case, of course, there are control not case, there are swap case, um, and so on and so forth. And so eventually um, the, the results are uh, either simulated or can be run on a real quantum computer. The results, of course, are the circuits that you create, and so you have to play your cards in a way to maximize the, the probability of, uh, of flipping your, your, your qubit. Um, and of course, when I say that it can be played by everyone, it means uh, also that uh, while we are at the moment developing an app tutorial, at the moment is not yet present, but in the QPlay Learn website, we have, of course, material to explain in simple way how the quantum logic gates uh, work. So um, it is connected to this online material where you can uh, very intuitively see how the, the, what is the action of the gates and therefore learn how to better play um, the, the game. Um, so I will uh, conclude my talk. I just gave a very brief overview, but I will conclude my talk uh, with uh, um, just a few of the collaborations that presently uh, are going on. Uh, there are so many projects we are developing and I will not mention them explicitly, but I just want to mention um, the fact that uh, Marie Lucchiofalo uh, is uh, one of the co-coordinators uh, of the pilot program on outreach and education um, quantum for you. Uh, and this is uh, a huge for you. <laughs> okay, it's here, uh, which is part of the quantum plug. So it's part of the coordination and support action uh, on, um, um, uh, on outreach and education uh, in the, within the quantum technology flagship. We're also collaborating with CERN, in particular with the Quantum Technology Initiative. Uh, we have a, a long going uh, collaboration uh, with uh, IBM. Uh, and of course, um, many of the activities we do are part of uh, um, the startup uh, of which I'm co CEO, which is algorithmic, and uh, of Institute Q, that is our national institute for quantum science and technology. Technologies. Um, and I want to just uh, conclude by mentioning that we are really eager always uh, to have contributors, uh, to have collaborators, and to involve uh, and, and to have people who help us growing uh, in a way uh, according to the, what we believe uh, is, um, is, is a needed, a much needed way of uh, interacting and communicating and creating contents to explain uh, quantum science and technologies to everyone, and therefore to bridge the gap and, and connect the different um, uh, parts of the ecosystem, be it academia, uh, startup companies, established companies, policy makers, uh, and, and, and also, of course, the schools, because we all know that the education for creating uh, the workforce that will lead to the, um, uh, that is so much needed for, for the companies nowadays is, is one of the key 
components. And so this is what we are uh, trying to do. And with this, I thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Sabrina, for this fascinating talk. Uh, I mean, it's, it's really fascinating to see how much uh, you're involved with and how the different types of activities. I mean, it's really a nice contrast also to what Stefan was talking about, the different kind of uh, perspective um, or yeah approach you take. So one, before I start with the questions from the chat, I allow myself the, the, the authority as the, as the host uh, to ask you, but you mentioned policymakers um, towards the end. So I'm, I'm curious just how because what we noticed when speaking to them, when they're speaking about the technology, they often find it very um, scary also because they're not experts, of course, in the technology. So when you speak about your work, what are the responses uh, when you speak to yeah, policymakers or people who are not from sort of have a quantum background? Yes, yes. Uh, well, of course, I think that the most important, um, the most important thing is, is again, uh, try to be open minded. And we are always as scientists, we are always, uh, um, I would say, underestimating, or, or I don't know how to say underestimating or overestimating, we use a language which naturally uses includes some terms which are not common language common knowledge okay so for example it's very often that i can say even, even to say the quantum state state the term state is a thing that is a, is a term that we use naturally i mean it seems that everybody should know what is the quantum state it's a simple question of really language but so therefore you have to make an operation at the very beginning which is re-examining the language that we use when we communicate by be a, a rebuilding really little by little uh, what we think might be the appropriate ways of communicating, but by having in mind, importantly, that people think differently from us. And I mean, us scientists, okay? They think differently. They have diff completely different backgrounds. So it's an operation that we are trying to do really at the level of the language. Um, and, and I think that this is what makes the difference. In my experience, this, this is where we have been most successful. I can I can relate to that a lot. I have I have a background in philosophy and I work with a quantum scientist. So this this work of translation and managing to translate it then also to to customers or industry. Uh, I think you're speaking. That's really really important. And I think you're really spot on there. Um, turning to the questions in the chat, we had a couple. So the first one is on um, quantum games, um, and they ask so. It, they say that's indeed a very promising tool for education, um, but they wonder whether it is possible that quantum games could lead to an increase of the hype we currently see around quantum. And yeah, yes. what was your comment to that? Yes, it, it, it definitely yes. Uh, there is this risk, and that's why when we organize quantum game jumps, we have to be very careful. I always say it is extremely important that there are experts, quantum physicists, which are present and which are conveying the main message uh, or the main distinction between when we want to inspire you know, inspire um, the, the audience uh, with quantum related ideas. And when we want to really say this will be useful for the quantum industry, these two things are very different. And it's, I mean, I'm not saying that one should not do it, but it should always clarify the difference between the two. And then it's okay. So uh, it's a very important, I, I find it extremely important um, that the presence of, of, of quantum physics um, is, is, um, is there also to give this clear message um, and not to create yeah. Hype. yeah, I think, yeah, but that, that I think the kind of distinction between inspiring and then really making clear what the, the use cases then really could be, I think that's a very, very important one. Um, to stay with games, someone is asking whether the games are in English or Spanish or other languages. So what languages essentially are they in? At the moment, they are all in English, uh, but uh, we are about to create uh, two versions. The, the, the first two, uh, let's say, sisters um, platforms of QPlay Learn uh, will be uh, in Italian and Finnish. And it's just because, well, I mean, most of the operators <laughs> are Italians and we are based in Finland. But uh, ideally, we will be actually translating to, to, uh, to Spanish, for example, is something which will not happen uh, very far along the way because it is not in itself, um, let's say, a very um, demanding. We, we, you need to have resources, mostly financial resources, um, but it is something that is doable. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. And then there's a question, and I think that will be the final one before the break. Um, someone is wondering how your activities around 
um, uh, QPlay Learn and around algorithmic, how they fit together? Yes, that's a very good point. So 99% uh, of the activities of, of, of QPlay Learn, uh, the platform are absolutely uh, free uh, for everyone. So Algorithmic is a startup which develops uh, algorithms uh, on um, mostly for, for life sciences, uh, software for the life sciences. But because we believe uh, as uh, co-founders and as uh, a main uh, um, let's say part of algorithmic, that it is extremely important for our own business also to offer tools to the community in order to grow and in order to um, improve the understanding of, again, I was talking about the language, once again, improve the understanding of what is right and what is wrong. We are offering a lot of our hours really um, to the community for building for free uh, the platform that is QPlay Learn. There is only one product which is, uh, um, which is not uh, freely available and this is the retraining for companies course, but all the rest is, uh, is absolutely free. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Sabrina. Um, that was really inspiring and I think concludes perfectly the first half of our session today. We had, as I said, really Stefan on kind of more the funding structure and how that works. And then your really different approach, but also very valuable approach um, to making sure that quantum computing in Europe takes off. Um, we'll have a 10 minute break now. So I encourage everyone to stand up, get a glass of water, get some coffee, uh, move your body a little bit so that you're back with fresh brains for um, Amira and Amira will spe speak about quantum computing applications. So join me in virtually thanking Sabrina and, and Stefan again and uh, we'll see you back in 10 or minutes. somewhere to stretch your legs. Um, welcome back and I'm pleased to have Amira with me. Um, Amira is a researcher at IBM Quantum and a PhD fellow at the University of KwaZulu Natal. I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Amira, in South Africa. Um, she works on the intersection of quantum mechanics and quantum machine learning, um, and she holds an undergraduate degree in actuarial sciences and an honors degree in quantitative finance and a master's degree in physics. And besides pursuing her PhD in quantum computing, she's an active member of numerous community-driven initiatives centered around strength, strengthening science and technology. And Amira will speak about um, quantum applications. And with that, I'll just remind you that you can post questions to Amira in the Q&A and we'll ask them to her live. Um, and without further ado, Amira, I'm excited to listen to you. Welcome. Okay. Thank you so much, Mira. Okay, let me see if I can get this right. You tell me if you see it in full screen, yeah? Yeah, perfect. We see it in full screen. Okay, okay wonderful. So thank you so much for, yes, for inviting me and um, to Mira and Fabio for hosting this, this really nice session. So. Um, as Mira said, yes, I'm Amira. I work at, at IBM and I do some research there. And so today I really want to take you through some of the applications that we're focusing on in quantum computing and specifically in the Zurich lab. So this is not everything that we're focusing on. So um, if something is missing that you're wondering if we are actually thinking about or doing, please feel free to ask and um, yeah, hopefully I know the answers. So um, before I go into the applications, I just want to uh, remind you of something that I think is quite important about quantum computing. So I think every single marketing slide about motivating quantum computing is some variation of this, right? Where they always say, if you have so and so many qubits, you can represent so many states. And it always sounds very impressive to um, to somebody hearing this for the first time, right? So this exponential Hilbert space that we have in quantum computing is always this argument for why we should uh, consider it, why we should look into it and invest in it. But um, I don't feel like this does quantum computing justice because in my opinion, what, what I think makes it even more special or, or um, uh, probably more interesting is this idea of the fact that we have probability amplitudes and that we can create interference with these probability amplitudes in quantum computing, right? So this in some sense allows us to think about quantum mechanics as a generalization of probability theory. And this is super powerful. And this is something that I think we don't fully have figured out yet in the application. So with that in mind, I wanted to show you a snapshot of um, the development roadmap that we have at IBM. So at IBM, of course, we believe very strongly in the success and the importance of quantum computing. And so what you're looking at here is a timeline of the achievements that we wish to have. So probably what's the most important or um, maybe the most interesting for you is 
the devices on the um, on the bottom here, and you can see that we're aiming to really scale our devices. Um, so these are the uh, superconducting hardware that we're looking at. And um, yeah, I think in next year we, we hope to have um, already a device with over 400 qubits and, and um, increase this to over a thousand by the year after. And another thing that I want to point out in this roadmap, which I think is quite relevant, is the fact that we are now shifting to a really a more like application focus with quantum computing. So Qiskit, which you of course will all have heard of, um, or at least I hope you've heard of it, is our open source quantum computing software library. And now we're really developing and, and structuring things such that it focuses on um, pure applications. So in particular, this is um, these four categories, natural science, finance, optimization, and machine learning. So today I just want to make mention of um, of three of these applications, simulation, optimization, and machine learning. And uh, I'll probably focus more on the machine learning stuff because I'm a little bit biased there because this is where I do my, my research for, for IBM. Um, and like I said, this is um, not everything, right? There are still other applications and um, things that I, I won't make mention of today, unfortunately, because of, of time. Okay, so the first is, um, is simulation. And uh, why this is cool and why this is important, important application for, for quantum mechanics and quantum computing is because we can start to, um, to think about qubits or um, a quantum mechanical system as a way to represent or model uh, probabilities, right? And now remember I mentioned earlier that um, we can think of quantum mechanics as a more general way to, to describe probability theory because we don't just have to work with numbers on the real line. So we have probability amplitudes that can be complex. And so now the question is, well, what can we do with this more general probability theory or probability distributions that we can describe? Can we perhaps um, model distributions in a more robust manner? And how do we do this? And so this is something that we're thinking about a lot at IBM. And in particular, an algorithm called amplitude estimation is really important in trying to discover or, or uh, recover a, some probability distribution. Right? So we can use qubits to model probability distributions and then use amplitude estimation to try and understand how does this distribution actually look. And so the applications of this is um, really quite far stretching, right? So you can imagine like anything with uncertainty or, or a distribution underneath it could perhaps benefit from this. And so some work that we've looked at um, in particular is for example, option pricing with quantum computers. So options for those of you who don't know are just financial instruments. And um, these financial instruments are modeled or move in terms of an underlying asset or instrument that has some sort of price distribution. So you can imagine a stock or a share, and this has some underlying probability distribution of its price. And then this option is basically the payoff of this option depends on, on the movement of the underlying price or share price. So this uncertainty or this expected payoff of the, of the option is something that we can model using quantum computing. So this is something that we showed in, in a few papers of how to actually load a probability distribution. And this probability distribution governs some sort of price of an asset or, um, or some financial instrument. And then we can start to calculate interesting things like, like option pricing and so on. Um, but of course, you know, there are, are many other things that we can do. So another interesting thing I think is um, this idea of modeling credit risk or risk in general, anything that involves some sort of probability of loss or in this case, probability of default is the term used. And so if you have some uh, probability distribution, you can try to encode this probability distribution into, into a quantum state and then calculate like what is um, the probability of losing a certain amount or the probability of this event occurring and so on. And so this is, I think, um, quite interesting and a lot more work can be done in this space. And especially if the probability distributions that we are trying to encode or understand um, are sort of quantum in nature or perhaps quantum computing can enhance these, um, these probability distributions or these calculations and make them more robust. So here's another example of, um, of a piece of work if you're interested in this. And then I think something that's still one of my, um, one of my favorite uh, examples to, to show or to talk about um, is this idea of um, Monte Carlo simulation using quantum computers. So this is uh, again, a, a picture of the paper. So if you're interested, you can Google quantum risk analysis. But in short, what happens here is um, we basically use this, this idea of quantum amplitude estimation, which is um, an algorithm I mentioned earlier, which is quite important. And, um, and with that algorithm, we can show a quadratic speed up. So if you look at the graph here, you can show a quadratic speed up over um, a very traditional and commonly used algorithm 
classically called Monte Carlo simulation. So Monte Carlo simulation basically tries to understand the probability distribution of something very complicated. And so um, this is used all over. Um, you can think of applications anywhere in nature and finance and so on. And so now if we can speed up this, um, this understanding of whatever this complicated distribution is, well, then you can imagine the implications are quite cool, right? Especially for example, um, again, with risk analysis or modeling um, assets in, in real time with finance in financial applications. So um, I think this is quite nice. And the paper is also very clear. So um, I'm probably leaving out a lot of details, but you can of course catch them here. And um, just for completeness, the reason I think, or a lot of, of our focus is really trying to go into um, new developments of this amplitude estimation algorithm that I mentioned. So amplitude estimation has been around um, for a very long time. And now with well, well, the fact that we finally have quantum computers available to us, we are really looking into how can we enhance this algorithm. So a few papers have come out, um, for example, here, this one, amplitude estimation without phase estimation, where they had some benefits to, to this um, algorithm because they were able to show good, good performance and, um, and good simulations, but uh, it lacked a little bit of theoretical justification. And then conversely, a paper that came out after that, you know, had some solid theory, but then lacked um, ability to scale this approach. So some of the work that we've done in this paper here with this iterative quantum amplitude estimation really tries to uh, unify the benefits of, of those two approaches where we have um, now some theory backing what we do and then also some simulations and, and scalability of, of the hardware and performance. So this I think is, is also quite a nice result with this. Okay, so now going back to the applications that was a little bit about simulation and now a little bit about optimization. So um, I won't spend too much time here because I think it's rather intuitive, right? And um, why we would look into optimization using quantum computers because quantum computers can very naturally handle a lot of stuff, right? I mean, as we mentioned earlier, like the, the exponential Hilbert space allows us to encode a lot of information in a lot um, with a lot less resources. So now if we can do this, then we can start to perhaps optimize over a much larger space, state space um, and more efficiently. So, um, Quadratic binary optimization, for example, uh, unconstrained binary optimization, for example, is a very nice application where we're trying to see just exactly how quantum computers handle um, optimization problems and where can we apply these. So again, I will use um, a finance example because <laughs> this is a little bit my background and, and what I'm, I'm used to, but um, you, know, you, you can really run wild with this because anything that's formulated in this complicated optimization problem when you have lots of constraints and lots of variables. And as these variables grow, these problems become more and more difficult to model. Quantum computers can handle this quite naturally. And so, um, so yes, so portfolio optimization, for example, is, is one such case. Um, where you typically try to build this thing called this efficient frontier. And so in this piece of work here, we uh, discuss this quantum optimization pro approach to this method. But um, another cool thing that I thought came up, uh, that, that I think is quite nice that came up recently in something called a Kiskit challenge. So um, the Kiskit community often put together these, these challenges for the general public to take, take part in. And the most recent one posed a crop yield optimization problem. So this was also a, a quadratic binary optimization or quadratic optimization problem and uh, with real life application, right? So it was like, we have lots of um, different types of crops. We have a certain budget um, each crop and um, you know, planting each crop affects each other crop and the prices also interact with each other. So how do we optimize over all these variables and do this efficiently such that we save, um, we save money? And so this was, a, I think, quite a cute problem. And um, of course, as this problem scales, then you know, um, understanding the benefits of quantum computing becomes a lot clearer. And then just circling back to this snapshot of the development roadmap that I showed you earlier, um, where we're, we're trying to really hone in using Qiskit, our, our coding platform or our coding library on these, on these applications, optimization is one of these, right? So if you're interested, here is a link to the documentation where we have all these nice tutorials explaining different solvers and optimizers that we have and we've developed um, that actually integrate very nicely with the hardware as well. Um, and I think I, I can make these slides available through the, the host so that you have access, but the recordings will probably also be available as well. So, okay. All right. And now lastly, I just want to spend the last couple of minutes on, uh, on machine learning because 
yes, um, as I mentioned, this is where I do most of my research, but um, I think there's also a lot of um, hype around this area and um, perhaps uh, perhaps too much, but um, yes, hopefully I can motivate to you why I think this is interesting and why we at IBM are, are looking at this, this um, topic. So just very quickly, um, quantum machine learning is this, this phrase or this, this term that people throw around quite often. But um, what does it actually refer to? And when we think about it at IBM, what are we what are we specifically talking about? So very often it's cast into these um, into these four paradigms here, where you have um, an interplay between classical data or quantum data that is processed on a classical or quantum computer. So CC, for example, is classical data on a on a classical computer. So your typical traditional um, classical machine learning. And so at some um, at the Zurich lab in particular, what we think of, what we do when we think about quantum machine learning, I would argue is mostly in this block here, where we have classical data that typically exists in the form of, of vectors or matrices, or whatever you want to think about them. And then the, the idea is like, how can we process this classical information, this classical data um, in a algorithm where part of that algorithm, or maybe even all of that algorithm um, is enhanced through quantum computation. So in short, we have some classical data, we process it somehow with a quantum computer and maybe even a classical computer, but um, yeah, we can just think of it as quantum. And, um, and is this interesting? Do we get some sort of benefit? And um, how, how can we understand this? And so um, I like this, this picture here because I think this really sums up a lot of what the, the literature is doing where um, you typically start with some training data for a problem, right? So let's say your problem is you want to classify pictures of cats and dogs. You want to know what's a cat, what's a dog if I give it to a machine learning algorithm. So this can act as your training data. You pass this data into a model and that model needs to give you an answer. So I pass an image of a cat, it needs to tell me is it a cat or a dog. And um, if it gets it right or wrong, then this needs to go in some sort of scoring function. And then we need to go back and we need to optimize the model. We need to tweak and we need to change it such that we get the best model, right? So, so in short, this idea of, of classical quantum, classical data on a quantum computer, just means that we have classical data here and this block, this model is, um, is somehow incorporating quantum computation. Okay, but the argument from a lot of people is that um, the advantage of most quantum machine learning algorithms is immediately destroyed because we are working with classical data and we have to still load them onto a quantum computer. And then after we have them on the quantum computer, we still have to read out and measure the system and then in extract a answer from those measurements. And so any kind of speed up that we can hope for that, uh, that enhancement comes from this quantum computer is, uh, is often argued to be immediately killed because of this data loading step and this um, output kind of um, post-processing step. So, this is, um, this is a very good point, of course, and this does remove the advantage um, from a lot of, of known algorithms that have been posed in literature. And, um, and in particular, you know, people like to now separate these, these two kind of ideas where we have algorithms that are de designed and developed for something called fault tolerant quantum computation. So when we have these quantum computers that are error free, that are large and wonderful and can do everything, we have quantum machine learning algorithms that are written for that regime. And now the question for us in, in the Zurich lab at, at the IBM is, um, is really to look at this regime, this near-term regime, right? So where we have these noisy, small devices, these error-prone um, qubits, what can we actually do now with our, with our devices for machine learning? And so um, a nice piece of work that, that went into trying to answer this question and I put a snapshot of the title and um, appeared recently in Nature Computational Science is, um, is really trying to investigate the power of these quantum models. So they're, they're called quantum neural networks here, but you can think about them as simply parameterized quantum circuits. So quantum circuits where we have some parameters in there that we can, we can play around with, we can optimize them, tweak them, change them such that they solve some sort of machine learning task. So um, this piece of work really tried to investigate, okay, how do these, these parameterized quantum circuits, these quantum models, how do they fare against state-of-the-art classical machine learning neural networks? So the first question, of course, is like, um, are quantum machine learning models more powerful than these classical 
um, neural networks, right? And these classical neural networks are deemed to be extremely powerful. Of course, we know they work very well already. But um, taking a step back, how do we even measure power in the first place? So if you give me a statistical model, any statistical model, how do I even know um, its power? How do, I, how do I even quantify this? And this is actually still an open question in classical literature and quantum. And so a very naive approach is, for example, just imagine you have a very deep model, um, use the parameter count, right? So if, if you have um, a model with 10,000 parameters, intuitively the, this suggests that a model with 100,000 parameters would be more expressive or more powerful than the model with 10,000 parameters. Now, of course, this is not a very good way to estimate the power of a model because perhaps in this 100,000 parameter model, 99% of those parameters are not being used, for example, then that model would not be very good. It would actually be rather, rather weak. Um, whereas if the 10,000 parameters model had all those parameters being active and useful, then that could argue that that model is more expressive. So simply counting the parameters was suggested a while ago, but um, this is not a very smart or elegant way to estimate the power of a model. So what we proposed is using this idea of something called the effective dimension. And the effective dimension is really, I think, quite intuitive and beautiful because it says that um, it tries to really capture how many parameters in your model are active, are, are being used and, um, and are relevant. So this nice analogy of clouds in the sky, I think, represents this idea of the effective dimension, where clouds in the sky are embedded in a three-dimensional space. But what they actually occupy there is something called a fractal dimension. Their effective dimension is 1.37. So it's the smallest space in this, in this larger space that it's embedded. So using this notion, we went in and we started to look at different types of quantum models and how do they fare against classical neural networks. And what we found in short was this graph is basically saying that quantum neural networks of this kind seem to have a much higher effective dimension than these classical neural networks, meaning that their, their parameters in these models seem to be a lot more active than classical neural networks, which um, why is, uh, is still another, another open question which we, decide, which we um, hope to investigate in future studies. Okay, so I know I only have about um, five minutes left. Uh, Mira, please stop me if I'm going over. But the last five minutes, I just want to explain one last model and then we can take questions. So the last, so what I just spoke about now is the, the, how we investigated the power of, of quantum circuits or parameterized quantum models. But another place where I think um, there is a lot of hope for quantum advantage is in a different machine learning algorithm called a quantum support vector machine. And now if you don't know what a support vector machine is, um, don't worry, it's not very complicated. The idea is actually rather beautiful and simple and the possible applications again are endless. So I think this, this has a lot of um, room to be a high impact um, algorithm that has a good application. And so what support vector machines say is that imagine you've got data from let's say two different um, two different classes. So again, let's imagine cats and dogs. And let's say we can plot that data. So let's say these yellow dots belong to um, data points of cats and these blue dots are data points of dogs. And on the axes, let's say we've got the height and the weight of the cats and the dogs. And now we're trying to group these things together. So we try to group them by coming up with some decision boundary. So this white line here tells us anything to the left is, is a cat and anything to the right is a dog. Now support vector machines just basically learn this, this decision boundary by maximizing the distance to the nearest data points of each class. So, so the technical details here, again, are not so important. What's cool is that like, okay, what if we can't train a line, right? Well, what, what if we can't train this simple decision boundary? What if the data is not linearly separable like how it is depicted here? So um, what happens is we have uh, data that's not linearly separable. So let's say now the data looks something like this. We can't draw a line through the data such that we separate the blue and the yellow dots, right? This is just not possible. So what happens in support vector machines is a transformation of data. We map the data typically to a higher dimensional space such that it becomes linearly separable again. So here we apply something called a feature map that takes our data from some sort of dimension, maps it to a high dimension. So in this case, one dimension to two dimensions. And now we can see we can draw a line such that we separate the blue and the yellow dots. And so with quantum computing, what's really interesting is that encoding your classical data into a quantum state corresponds to a transformation of data from one space to another. So it corresponds to a feature map, a mapping from one space to a typically higher dimensional space. So these quantum feature maps, we can imagine them as taking our data and loading them into a quantum circuit. So studying how these look and how we can get an advantage here, can we map data to quantum Hilbert space 
in ways that we can do interesting machine learning tasks is something that we're also really, really throwing a lot of research in. So if you're interested, I've, I've put a link to this Nature article here, which is really, really awesome, explains the idea very well. And then we also have some nice theoretical proofs that came out recently about how we can actually do this, where we can get some quantum advantage. Okay, and um, last, uh, second to last slide is, I just wanted to mention that we also have this Qiskit machine learning module, which is really cool. So if you played around with PyTorch, for example, we've got a torch connector, we've got these models that I mentioned, uh, quantum neural networks, quantum support vector machines, all pre-coded for you to go and play around with, and uh, really nice tutorials as well. Okay, so with that, I want to end with the last slide of um, the, the, the golden question, right? When can we expect finally a solid quantum advantage that we can finally see, um, okay, we can throw all our money into quantum computing and it's, it's worth it. So, um, of course, eventually we are going to reach a stage where we just can't simulate um, things anymore, right? So, for example, with 50 qubits, things already become very difficult to simulate on even our high, high performance computers. So at IBM, we expect the first sort of quantum advantage to be demonstrated when we have 100 logical qubits or 100 qubits of sufficient quality. And um, I just put this here for fun. Like lastly, will this be, will this advantage come from machine learning? Well, maybe, um, I personally hope so because I'm biased, but um, you know, today I presented two other applications and uh, yeah, I guess uh, it's exciting to be a researcher in this field and, um, and let's see. So yes, thank you so much for listening and please feel free to ask questions or email me if you want to chat. Thank you so much, Amira. It was a very, very interesting talk. Uh, so, so I am, you see again my face, uh, different face from Mira I just took over and I will moderate from now till the end of the session. So I will just go on and ask some questions. I see already a uh, few popping up in the Q&A bottom. So the first one is very general, but I think interesting for many. Uh, how does IBM engage with clients uh, in uh, quantum uh, computing applications? Yeah, Fabio, you'd probably be much better at answering this question than me, right? Because I am just the lowly researcher that sits in the background. I think today is the first day I wore a shirt in about two years. So, so I'm, I'm definitely not the person that interacts with clients. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know, Fabio, if you want to say something, but um, I think you'd probably be better at answering it than me. Yeah. I, I, I think it's... Uh, it's um, so IBM interacts in the different uh, levels from uh, a first engagement where we introduce the system and what we uh, what we can offer already now and uh, what uh, quantum computing is and what are the potential potential applications so this is the first engagement and farther down the the, the road of uh, uh, engaging with potential clients uh, we start to work together on some projects uh, in some cases this goes on and becomes uh, uh, a line of research. So there are also projects where researchers from IBM and uh, um, potential clients or partners are working together on some applications. And um, so there are several layers of, of possibility for, uh, for engaging with, with clients. And uh, the research team and the developers are in, in, involved at some level in some of these layers, but not at the first, the first one, of course. Um, is, did I miss anything or would you like to add anything, Amira, here? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think you did. Yeah, great. Thank okay. you. Then Thank we you go on. Uh, can you elaborate on what are the bottlenecks in quantum machine learning? Yes, sure. So I think maybe the main thing, so quantum machine learning as we defined it in this talk, right, is really um, classical data and then interpreting it somehow on the quantum device. So I think the probably the biggest bottleneck is um, is loading data, especially data of a significant size with lots of features. So they have lots of um, lots of entries. If you think of one data point as a vector, and now this vector has lots of, of numbers in it. Now, how do we understand to load this data? And also, um, loading multiple data points takes takes time, right? So I would say that this is probably the biggest bottleneck. And the second is um, once we figured out this problem of how to load data, then how do we extract our um, our answers from the circuit. This is also not so clear. So, a lot of um, a lot of these a lot of research is going into trying to understand these questions. But at the moment, I think these are these are largely not figured out yet. 
And basically, a follow-up question is, is there any, any application of quantum machine learning in uh, finance, so specifically for that field? Yes, yeah, good question. So I guess I kind of mentioned the applications of uh, applications to finance um, with regard to simulation and so on, and like loading these distributions and in the other um, areas. But if you think of things as being parameterized and then optimization over these parameters, so let's say you don't know the distribution you want to learn, you want to, you want, or the, you don't know the distribution you want to load that models some sort of um, underlying price, for example. You can actually learn it or optimize it, right? So it's a train train an algorithm that involves a quantum circuit to, to learn this. So um, one example is um, looking at something called a QGAN, so a quantum generative adversarial network that essentially trains a probability distribution. And then this can this can be integrated into a financial application. So if you're interested, Google um, QGAN and finance, and you will also see some of our work that, that um, relates to quantum machine learning and finance. I think that's a very good answer. So uh, please check out the paper. We keep receiving questions. So I'll go with uh, this one. When you say quantum advantage in the context of quantum machine learning, what is the advantage, the advantage, uh, the, advantage uh, the execution speed, the training speed, or the accuracy of the, of the model? So this is a very good question. Yeah, this is, this is a very, very nice question because I think um, in the classical machine learning community, they've actually developed, um, in my opinion, a rather unhealthy way of thinking in that everybody always wants to find the fastest algorithm, the algorithm that gives you a case. 99.999% accuracy, but like the speed is all that matters, right? And now if we get caught in this trap in quantum machine learning about always chasing exponential speed ups, we might miss out on other advantages that present themselves. So in my opinion, I think it's not just speed. It's of course, exponential speed ups are amazing or important would justify quantum computation its use. But um, I think we have to really think about how we can do things differently and, and in a more interesting way. So I mentioned this idea of quantum feature maps encoding data into quantum Hilbert space. If we can find something innately quantum that's interesting and good for quantum machine learning, I mean, this is to me is, is absolute gold. So I think that there are lots of different types of advantages like the... Um, person who asked the question correctly stated, but it doesn't just end with, with speed ups. I would say that accuracy, of course, is also one of them um, and different types of computation and applications is definitely, yeah. It's always the, the answer is more complicated as soon as you dig a bit uh, <laughs> into, the, uh, into the topic. Uh, so let's, uh, let's continue. And we have uh, one more related to a career path. So which is the best path for a master's student to start a quantum career at IBM. As, as far as I know, I have seen, for example, at IBM Research Curie Club, all open positions require applicants to have a PhD. Um, so. Okay, yeah, maybe I can give a piece of advice that's quite general that I think helped me a lot is um, try to somehow make yourself stand out a little bit from everybody else, right? So try and, and perhaps maybe contribute to Qiskit's open source um, do, do, something, do something there that demonstrates your, your credibility and doesn't necessarily require you to have a formal education in something. If you are noticed by the quantum community at the moment, you know, we're, we're all very um, active or on Twitter or on social media and so on. If you can start to do contributions um, that, that benefit the community and, and get yourself noticed like that, I think um, it makes it very, very easy for you to, to then try and get an internship at these companies like IBM and, and so on. So um, I would say try, uh, that's my piece of advice, is to, to somehow differentiate yourself, use your, your own unique skill set, which you undoubtedly have, and, um, and try to, to leverage that to make yourself stand out and, and then apply for these internships. I can absolutely confirm what you just said. I also want to mention that not, not all the positions, there are projects, there are uh, uh, we have master's students opportunity and uh, other type of internship uh, opportunity. So not only PhDs can apply and can uh, already start to work in quantum. In maybe uh, since you, you mentioned ecosystem, I think it's interesting to, so uh, the question says, I noticed that you are based in South Africa. Uh, what does the quantum ecosystem look like there? Um, yes, yeah, so <laughs> uh, I think we are still quite premature in, um, in, certain, in certain ways. Um, so the quantum ecosystem, at least we have, we have uh, some universities looking at, at quantum computing and the applications. We also now have a, 
a national roadmap with our government drafting quantum computing as, as one of the um, things that they're going to put funding into. So it does look exciting, but I think there's a lot of opportunity for um, startups, for example, for, for more research, for def for hardware, I think will be a little bit hard because we need just so much funding and so much money that this might be too late. But um, in terms of the research, I think we are still doing some some cutting edge work. And um, and yes, yeah, I don't know. I think we are still very early, but, um, but there's a lot of excitement and a, a lot of um, uh, interest in quantum in South Africa. It's good to see that. That is not only Europe, US or China, but it's actually across all over the world. Um, maybe we take the last questions uh, and the sake of time. So what is the typical size? That's a more technical question. What is the typical size of a simulation problem where the quadratic speed up of, an amp of uh, the amplitude estimation wins over the faster gate time of classical computers? Yeah, so I don't know. I don't know this one offhand. I, I'd, I'd say maybe look at that quantum risk analysis paper because there, there's a graph that has um, the system size on the x-axis and then both algorithms plotted, right? So I think the, the classical one was the Monte Carlo and then the, the amplitude estimation. And then there is a point where they cross over. And if you read off the x-axis, you'll see exactly the size of the system. So I think it depends also like on, on um, your problem and what, what setup you have and blah, blah, blah. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, just Google that quantum risk analysis paper and you should probably see it in the, in the graph that you look at. Perhaps I will leave this question in the, in the Q&A and you can answer maybe uh, uh, pointing at the paper that you just mentioned. Sure. Okay, cool. Okay, do that. Perfect. Okay, then thanks a lot, Amira. It was really interesting. And now we go on and introduce the next speakers. This is Professor Jonathan Holm. Welcome, Jonathan. Uh, so a, pre, a brief introduction before you take over. Um, uh, Professor Jonathan Holm is leading a trapped ion quantum information group at ETH in Zurich. He's also scientific advisor and scientific director of the ETH and PSI quantum computing hub. He holds a PhD from University of Oxford and he became a full professor at ETH um, in 2019. And his research uh, uh, focuses on the control and manipulation of the quantum states of atomic ions for scaling up trapped ions quantum uh, uh, computation. So Jonathan, please, uh, the stage is yours. Okay. Uh, just. So I hope you can see my okay. screen. Yeah. Yes. Good. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. It's the first time I attended this Quantum Industry Day, and uh, it's nice to see the preceding talks. Uh, so I'm here today to try and tell you a little bit uh, about the CTH PSI Quantum Computing Hub, uh, which is uh, starting up in the last year or so and uh, constitutes at the moment this little building uh, on the campus of the Paul Scherer Institute uh, in Argyle. Uh, and I want to give you some motivation for the founding of this hub and what we're trying to do there, uh, primarily in the context of my own field, which is uh, trapped ion quantum computing. So I think we probably have had plenty of information on why we're here. Uh, the basic notion of what we're interested in in quantum computing is the fact that uh, quantum systems have a possibility for scaling on certain algorithms, which uh, is much better scaling than you get in a classical system. So there's a sort of mock graph here with an exponential y axis, where you see that the size of problem increases and a classical computer rapidly hits uh, the age of the universe. And uh, meanwhile, a quantum computer, despite having a much lower gate speed, uh, has a better scaling and so is able still to complete the problem on a relevant time scale. And of course, this field really uh, was uh, founded in the 1980s, probably was given its biggest push by the uh, invention of algorithms that could exhibit this scaling for relevant tasks. And the most famous of those is uh, Shaw's algorithm for cracking, for instance, the keys that we have in RSA uh, cryptography. But more broadly, the notion is that previously incomputable problems, problems that even our biggest supercomputers cannot cope with, uh, become accessible. And I think as we saw in the previous talk, uh, there's a lot of uh, interest, speculation, etc. because a lot of people have problems that they don't know how to do on classical computers or that they know scale badly. And there's this possibility now for quantum computers to access 
in a more efficient way uh, and make possible some of these algorithms. And there's really broad and unknown scope there. I think that's part of what you see explored in the previous talk is that people are uh, exploring the many possibilities this may add, and we're still learning about where this may be applied. But of course, this also creates the possibility for quantum computing to be uh, greatly disruptive, and that's uh, of importance to the economy. So one of the things we can ask if we think about uh, problems and we try and get a concrete problem and ask how many, what size of quantum computer do we need to solve these problems? And that was something that kind of obsessed one of my colleagues a few years ago. That was Matthias Troyer, who's now working for uh, Microsoft. And he then got together with uh, chemists, Marcus Ryer at TTH, uh, and they were considering uh, the harbor process, if you like, and the fact that plants seem to fix nitrogen from the air in a much more energy efficient way than we have in our uh, industrial processes today. So the interest in this problem is it's got a major in, uh, industrial implication. And at the heart of the problem lies the understanding of uh, a molecule. And of course that at some level is a physics problem. Uh, and so it's got a very clear analogy that a quantum computer or that there is a sort of case to be made that quantum computers offer speed up for physics problems. In fact, mo most of the time, that's the most natural uh, speed up that you can see for, uh, for quantum computers. But the challenge comes in what you see at the bottom here. So they made estimates of what it would take to, uh, that for a quantum computer to outperform the best classical algorithms and produce a useful result uh, for this uh, uh, molecule. And what you see is required is about a million qubits uh, and 10 to the 17 gates. So uh, I'm going to put that in context in a moment, but that's very, very far beyond anything that we have in the laboratory today. Uh, and so it presents a huge challenge with regards to scaling, okay? So that's gonna be the main challenge that we have going forward. It's, I would guess, going to take uh, a couple of decades or so to get to quantum computers of this size, uh, and there's a major technology and science challenge to making that happen. So where are we with quantum computers today? I think we've uh, seen uh, results in various uh, technologies. Some of the ones that you'll hear most about uh, are, uh, for instance, the IBM quantum computers or the Google systems that are working with superconducting circuits. The system I work with, uh, I think, has very equivalent performance, uh, if not even better in many regards. Uh, that's these trapped atomic ions. Uh, last week saw the floating of Iron Q on the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, and so there's clearly companies active in this area too. So Iron Q, AQT is uh, based in Innsbruck and actually are collaborators of mine. Uh, and Honeywell also is making a large impact in this field. And on top of these two technologies, there are multiple others that are really coming up in a nice way. Rydberg atoms, I think we've seen earlier in this session, spins in solids uh, also have some interesting uh, aspects. So if we look at these systems today, we'll see that people can put to collections of quantum systems together that look like a few tens of qubits. But when you look at serious metrics of what the size of these quantum computers are, and a nice one in that respect is this IBM quantum volume, you find that the record is held, for instance, by this Honeywell uh, device, which has about 10 qubits in that sort of evaluation. And the challenge is that uh, we don't, uh, we would like to build bigger systems, and clearly we can build bigger systems, but the thing that limits this today is the accuracy of the operation. So we need to be able to build bigger systems while being even more accurate than we, we can produce today. So scaling up to these levels of say a million qubits, which is what's going to be required if we're going to be tolerant to errors that we're making, it's a huge scientific, but both the scientific and technological challenge. It's, it's one of the big challenges of today's technology. Uh, and that presents a different aspect if you're coming from my view, and I've worked throughout my career in this field. Uh, and what we see is an increased focus on technology because that is in some cases or many cases what's limiting what we can do. So just to illustrate that, and I think a similar story could be told on the superconducting side, but I would leave Andreas Valraff to do that in the context of our center. I just tell you a little bit about how this works in trap times. And so to illustrate some of the problems that we're trying to solve with the ETH PSI hub. So one of the things that's going on in trapped ions and the reason that Honeywell actually produce good gate fidelities is that they modularize their approach. They break down the system that, so that in any given region of their processor is only a small number of ions. 
but what this does, this modularization, is it actually results in a technical duplication. Instead of having one iron trap with many ions in, you have many iron traps which are replicating the same sort of system over again. And you have to replicate, for instance, optical delivery of light to many zones in parallel to make use of this new architecture. So it's not the only approach to modularizing iron traps, but in both cases, the, the technical complexity goes up dramatically once you choose this modularization approach. Yeah, so somehow there's a hurdle before you can actually get to the scales that some of the other devices people are running can achieve. And one of the challenges, and I'm gonna use it to illustrate the challenges we have in our lab is, is just the optics. So if you came to my lab and still, if you come to one of my labs, you would see really a massive optics all over an optical table because everything is an optical beam in free space. And what we've done in the last few years is to change the picture of that. Uh, and the ch change that we make now is that instead of delivering light through free space, there's a bundle of fibers going into a cryostat which bring the light uh, into the iron trap chip, which the ions are trapped just above the chip. And the key to that has been to introduce integrated photonics. So it's the fabrication, microfabrication, allows us to integrate photonic wave guides into the structure of the trap, allows us to structure, make structures that can deliver the light out of the trap to hit the ions. So how does this look? Uh, as a process, what this looks like is that we draw up designs of where we want waveguides to be. We design uh, couplers, grating couplers to deliver light. And we send these out to a commercial foundry who then make a die with multiple uh, wafers on. Uh, and each of these, if you like, or multiple uh, dies on a wafer, I should say. And each of these has many designs for different iron traps. And then we pick one of those. We mount it up in our cryostat. Here you see the electrical connections wire bonded on. Here is actually where the bundle of fibers are. And we run that in a cryostat and we try with all quantum gates. And I think one of the nice surprises that we had, we worked very hard at the uh, coupling efficiency to try and get as much light onto these chips as possible, uh, was that our gates produced in this uh, system were actually as good as the gates we could produce in free space. And that was really one of the first shots that we have uh, using this integrated optics. But there's another challenge that comes once you start to react to what gets produced in a commercial foundry. And you see it here that many designs came out in a single run from this commercial foundry. Uh, and so their turnaround times are actually much faster than our turnaround times. So somehow we start to be a bottleneck because the testing time becomes precious. And that's a little bit of problem of the organization of our university lab. So in the next generation, we're going to go further. We want to fully integrate all the optical delivery, which we didn't do so far. So far, we introduced uh, visible and infrared light. Now we need to introduce also ultraviolet light by introducing more uh, materials into the structure of the trap. Uh, and this is going to allow us to fully integrate all of the light sources that we use in our experiments. And that really is a key because it starts to make you think I can scale. Right? So suddenly, instead of dealing with an iron trap that has a single zone with 30 ions in, this wafer layout that you're seeing here, which is something that's in our designs, has one, two, three, four by five zones in which we'll be able to trap uh, similar iron trap systems. And all of them are supplied by light coming from integrated optics. So we see here that commercial fabrication, if you like, makes a breakthrough in our ability to run many parts in parallel. But the challenge of that will be new. Uh, we then have to calibrate all these systems in parallel. And that's really, again, an engineering challenge. It's about how to automate everything that we're doing. Yeah? So there's a different challenge to the usual university challenge. That is, automation has to be key to calibrating the system. And we think further than that. So in the next phase, uh, this is sort of a, a cartoon of what might be involved. What I've told you about so far is, is sort of optical wiring. Uh, these little blue things are these grating couplers for delivering light. But in the next phase, what we think about is uh, modulating light on chip. So we need electro-optic devices or acousto-optics on chip, uh, having detection of single ions on chip. So again, uh, devices that convert light into electrical signals that we can use for readout. And another part of it, and another increasing complexity that I didn't mention, is that there are lots of electrodes on these traps, and they all need to be supplied by voltages. And there, again, just an illustration coming from uh, an, a sort of neighbor lab, if you like, a lab that we are familiar with is at Lincoln Laboratories. 
uh, where they started to say to themselves, okay, so let's take these electrodes and supply them with integrated uh, DACs, which can then are integrated at the cryojet in the cryostat inside the trap. And so take the complexity of delivering many channels of electrical signal to something that's embedded in the trap structure itself. So this fabrication challenge then is one where we need interfaces between foundries and between uh, laboratories. Uh, one of the things that we've also been working on in the last few years in the context of a FET Open project is this Piedmons project. And you see that that links Infineon, who are a major semiconductor uh, manufacturer in Europe, uh, to Innsbruck, that's Rainer Blatt's group, and ourselves uh, sitting at ETH Zurich. Uh, so Infineon, what can they do? They, they're one of the major uh, MEMS fabs, if you like. They've got a research fab in Villach in, in Austria. Uh, so they can produce a pretty advanced uh, fabrication stack up. And then they deliver these. They do some preliminary testing. Yeah, they deliver a whole wafer of maybe 100 of these. Uh, and then we get to package them up and test them in our cryogenic system, uh, which is uh, done by a researcher in my lab. And similar to the problem with uh, a system where we instigate, so we order our chips from Lionix, here is a situation where Infineon are re ready to deliver chips on a fast turnaround time. And we run into the same university problem, but uh, it's we have our own interests and things that we would like to do in the lab. Uh, and what, what's needed here is a testing uh, bed for uh, people to bring their technologies and, and try it out. So that's the motivation really for this ETH PSI quantum computing hub, is to take the fact that at ETH Zurich, we have both in trapped ions and superconducting qubits, world leading teams in quantum computing and a lot of knowledge in quantum computing. And I should say that the knowledge expands beyond uh, superconductors and ions, but at the moment, these being the primary candidates in quantum computing, this is a good place to start, yeah. The challenge here is that we work with small teams with students who have to get uh, results which maybe are not aligned with these fast uh, testing timescales. And we would like to align that with PSI because PSI does have experience of larger user experiences, if you like, and operates large facilities. So what we want to do is to unite that uh, in a collaborative effort towards large scale uh, quantum computing. So just as an illustration of the things that PSI does that are border science and technology in exactly the sort of way which we think could be interesting, uh, here is a detector for the CMS experiment at CERN, okay? And what this is is arrays of thousands of uh, detector modules, each one which is a multi-pixel device with uh, sort of direct processing of data because there's massive amount of data in these detectors. And PSI there, they uh, make unusual chips, right? They start to combine uh, a chip, which is a silicon sensor chip to read out chips that's got different properties with bump bonds that for instance can link the two. And this sort of interesting fabrication driven by the science, which makes use of clever use of CMOS into chips connects and data processing is very similar to the sort of packaging and, uh, and technological challenges we're facing in quantum computing today. So the start of this project is going to be in superconducting qubits led by Andreas Fahrer, in trapped ions led by myself. You see that these two systems, once they're in a cryostat, look very similar, but they're very different technologies indeed, okay? Uh, in my case, then uh, we have a lead for that uh, unit, which is Cornelius Hempel, who arrived in earlier this year. Labs uh, in the new building have been occupied since uh, July and things are starting to come together on both the superconducting and trapped ion side. And what are our aims? Uh, our initial aims are sort of to go towards uh, 100 qubit systems, if you like, which may be accessible remotely uh, to realize many qubit platforms available to the scientific community, offer a testing bed for companies and uh, to test their technologies, which are relevant to quantum computing, uh, and build up a long-term technical expertise, which can be relevant to developing new systems. And in the long term, if you like, my vision there is a collaborative. Uh, my long term vision would be that QIP is one of those major projects for, uh, for mankind, if you like, for science, uh, and that it's best carried out as a large collaborative project. And I hope that people can come together to do that. And hopefully PSI creates a good bed uh, for us to do that. But one of the very important things is certainly the synergies between PSI lab and the ETH lab. 
Uh, and in fact, that's uh, you see here a picture of a retreat we held recently, which is uh, the Iron Trap group, if you like. It combines both my lab at ETH, but also the 10 or so people who we already have working at PSI. Uh, and we look forward to the uh, future developments that come from that. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and look forward to any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, Jonathan. This was a very enlightening presentation on uh, how this new, this new collaboration, besides the research that you are currently uh, leading, it's very interesting to see uh, how this fits also in the Swiss landscape and how this is going to bring further definitely the, the quantum technology, both the technology and the science in, the, in Switzerland. So we'll start reading the, some questions. The first one is, uh, is there any connectivity between multiple ion traps on the same chip? And then uh, in this parallel chip design, can ions in different traps be entangled? Mm -hmm. So I think the, um, yeah, okay, I could sort of take it back. The, the main component of this approach is indeed to be modular, but the the thing that links ions to, or links information in different regions together is the fact that these ions are movable throughout the trap. And so uh, this mock-up is very much a cartoon, but the idea is that each of these gold things is an electrode that you can apply a time varying voltage to. And this allows you to shuttle information between different zones of the trap, yeah. Now, um, in the device that I showed, the initial idea, uh, because part of the challenge is just to get that system running, uh, the initial idea will be that we'll be able to do shuttling uh, along a line, but the uh, aim, if you like, is to be able to do that in a parallelized fashion such that we can have linked uh, systems along multiple lines. And I could show you another chip actually, which will try and explore 2D transport of ions, yeah, which is separate. Uh, and is a, another aspect that we'll be testing in the same run. Yeah, so uh, indeed there are designs for fully connecting these systems. The, the way the Honeywell system works today is that the, it's a fully connected system, but actually all the ions are held along a line in about three zones, maybe three to five zones. Yeah, so in that sense, these integrated devices will realize that same level of control, uh, but uh, so far it won't be a fully connected 20 zone system. And maybe as a, as a follow-up question, uh, uh, is there any plan also for developing chips in parallel that would be uh, linked and connected to each other? Yeah, I think that's, an, that's certainly on the roadmap. Yeah, I think we need to take things as we can grab them, if you like. So this is our focus at the moment, is more on a single chip. Uh, the, the need for, I mean, that's where, in a sense, the modularization by photonic links comes in. Uh, and one of the thoughts might be that there might be possible to integrate grading couplers that can pick up single photons. Uh, but we, at the moment, would just like to start with grading couplers that can pick up photons from the ions and be used for detection. And so we will, again, that will be something that's considered in the next generation, yeah, in this next run. And now the next question fits actually very well with what we are discussing right now. So what is the main technology, technological challenge for scaling up with trapped ions? Is the optics, is the electronics integration? So if you can comment on that. I think, I mean, in a certain sense, it all comes together, right? Uh, and scaling for anyone, I think, means a, a myriad of things coming together and is actually, this is the challenge very often, yeah. So certainly, um, I think I've been very encouraged by how well the integrated optics has worked in our very first try where, you know, the first gates we did were sort of within an order of magnitude of the very best gates in, in any approach yeah, of quantum computing. Uh, so that's very encouraging, but uh, there, there were certainly some bugs with these chips that we haven't yet solved and hopefully are solved in the next generation. Yeah. Uh, then even going to this next level of complexity, we see a bunch of uncertain things that we don't know how well it'll work, right? Uh, and this is then, we will solve that challenge in an optical sense. Probably separately at the moment, we will try and solve the electronics challenge. So looking at DACs, which are integrated into the system. My guess is there'll be some work to do on noise. There'll be work to do on uh, uh, correlations and, and crosstalk in those sort of systems, yeah? And then there's the case of putting these two types of system together. And I think there, that's why, where I actually find this um, 
CMS detector very interesting. There are two chips there, one which has got one type of fabrication, one which has got another type of fabrication which get bonded together in the end. Uh, and to me, it seems like, uh, you know, the maybe people in fabs can do very complicated things, yeah, but uh, maybe it's easier also to fabricate these two stages separately and then link them together later. And, and some of those tricks of being able to use different technologies in different stages will be then, I think, very useful tools in that chain. Thank you. Uh, we have another question. So with ion traps, there is no need to have a digital, uh, actually that's the question. So is there any need to have a digital to analog converter? Digital to analog converter. Um, well, so these voltages on these electrodes are analog voltages, yeah? So in the sense that these are continuous waveforms we apply in order to, in, uh, let me put it crudely, to gently move these ions around, right? If you suddenly switch a voltage on an electrode, then the ion will get a kick and, and then it won't be very happy for a little while. So you want to do this fairly smoothly. So this is why you see digital to analog converters. Is it strictly necessary? Maybe not, maybe it could be a digital signal that just gets very heavily filtered, uh, but certainly some sort of filtering or smoothing is, is required. And, and the DACs at the moment are what we're used to using. Uh, I do think there's a room for projects in saying, uh, do we experimentally even need DACs? Could we get away with just well-timed uh, digital signals which get filtered in an appropriate way? That's something, something we had on our agenda for a while without ever having a student which, who did it. Yeah. Yeah. So in the near future, we'll see, I guess, uh, more on, uh, on the digital analog converter. Yeah, let's see. If we can reduce the bits, that's very powerful, right? So somehow, if you look at heat dissipation and things on these sort of systems, the more bits you have, the more problems you have. If you want to be low dissipation, you want just low bit counts. And, and I guess we could get away with that, uh, but we haven't mapped that out yet. Yeah, indeed. I think it is just one of the main challenges for, for every, every platform that is working on quantum computing in general. Mm -hmm. um, okay, thank you so much, Jonathan. It was a very insightful and very interesting. Uh, to learn more about this uh, research on trapped ions uh, and on the PSI ETH quantum app. Uh, so thank you again. Now we move on to the next uh, uh, speaker in the agenda, who is Professor Eduardo Miranda. Eduardo, you're there. Perfect. I will briefly introduce you and then uh, uh, the, the, the stage will be yours. So Eduardo... Okay. Um, is a composer and artificial intelligence scientist. He's professor in computer music at the University of uh, Plymouth in UK. He's director of the Inter Interdisciplinary Center for Computer Music Research. Um, his book, Handbook on Artificial Intelligence for Music, has recently been published by Springer. And uh, he, he and uh, him and his team are pioneering research in, into quantum computing applied to musical creativity, which is clearly the topic of this talk. So without no further ado, uh, please, Eduardo, go on. You already can see your, your, uh, your taking over the screen. So I'll just mute can myself. You see my Can you see my, uh, yes, my screen? OK. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, Fabio, for this um, introduction, and uh, thank you for inviting me to, to speak in this session. Uh, I've been listening to the previous talks, um, very interesting things uh, for me to learn as well. So, um, as Fabio uh, um, briefly mentioned, I am a, I'm a composer, and I am, I've been working with computers to, to compose music for over the last 30 years or so. Um, and obviously I'm very excited about the uh, developments in quantum computing technology and its potential impact to, to, to music and the music industry in general. So in this talk, I will um, um, briefly uh, contextualize my, my research. Um, I will um, overview very briefly the quantum computing landscape in the UK. Um, then I will um, argue for um, 
why music um, in and quantum computers? Um, why um, I think it's interesting to develop uh, work in this area. Then I will um, introduce you very briefly to the uh, QTune project, um, which is a project that I've been um, developing in my research lab here in, in Plymouth. And I will end with um, a very brief uh, account on this uh, international landscape that is emerging uh, around this area of um, quantum computer music. Um, so um, there, there are a lot of things going on in the UK, um, as one would expect. Um, there is a very rich um, ecosystem of well-established companies and the startups, um, lots of startups, um, a number of which um, originated from uh, within a number of universities. And the UK government has a very impressive quantum technologies program, um, which includes uh, four uh, quantum technology hubs, uh, one for sensing, another for imaging, another for communications, and um, another for computing and simulation, which is the one that I'm most involved with. There is a comprehensive skills and training program uh, being developed. Uh, there is a national computing, quantum computing center. Uh, on the whole, there is a, there is a a 10-year quantum strategy led by the government. And um, so my, um, my research work um, is more um, connected to the um, quantum computing and the simulation hub, which I will um, talk a little bit later on. There are a number of links here if you want to have a look, but the, uh, the investment in this area is substantial. And there is a lot of incentive for developing um, uh, blue sky research, um, such as music, for example. Um, of course, if you are developing an industry, if you are developing uh, machines and kit and so on, uh, you obviously need to find some clients to use these things. And uh, the music industry is a big client. So um, it's only natural that we will be looking into um, developing this, uh, this industry. Um, okay, so um, let's skip this and, and I will uh, um, talk a little bit about music. So why, why music and, and uh, quantum computing? Uh, people um, hardly ever realize that uh, musicians actually um, started um, experimenting with computers far before the existence of the vast majority of scientific, industrial, and commercial computing applications we have today. For instance, in the 1940s, um, researchers in Australia installed a loudspeaker, which you can see in the picture here, on a, on a MK1 computer, which was one of the five or six machines in existence at the time. Um, to, to track um, the progress of uh, a program compilation. And uh, if there was a little uh, difference in the blips and blops that you heard, that, that was, uh, was indicating there was a bug. Uh, so that was a, a very uh, uh, interesting way to, to monitor uh, uh, program compilation. And in 1951, a mathematician who was also a composer uh, programmed this machine to play back a tune, and that is the birth of, um, you know, uh, of the field that we know today as uh, computer music. Um, since then, uh, companies and universities uh, all over um, started welcoming uh, musicians to join their research laboratories. Um, in this picture here, you can see an example of um, a musical score of a string quartet that was generated in the 1950s uh, using a piece of software um, running on one of the first mainframe computers built in the USA. And indeed, uh, in my case, uh, as a composer, I am a visiting researcher at uh, Cambridge uh, uh, Quantum in Oxford. Um, I'm working with the uh, Quantum Natural Language Processing Group. Um, we are looking into ways in which uh, 
tools for natural language processing can be used um, uh, in music processing. So uh, these early pioneers, these early composers um, in the 1940s and 50s, they paved the way for a thriving global music industry. So you can't, you can't think about music today without, without a computer. I mean that uh, from the production, creation, uh, commercialization, every stage of, of music making involves a computer in a way or another. Um, so it's natural to think that com you know, new computing technologies, uh, whatever they are, quantum, chemical, uh, biological, whatever computing technology you have in the future, it will have an impact in the musical industry and quantum computing is, is here to, to, to make that impact. Um, so just speaking in the UK, I mean, but this is uh, a trend uh, worldwide. Uh, the music sector is a key generator of economic growth and employment. Um, in, this is an old report already, but in 2019, um, the music industry contributed almost six billion pounds to the UK economy. This is employment, selling kit, concerts, uh, broadcasts, uh, uh, distribution of music through the uh, internet and, and so on. And the UK music exports is one of the fourth or fifth um, um, you know, um, in the rank of commodities that is exported every year. So, yeah, so only six years ago, on the left side here, you see a, a kind of a computer music studio sort of thing. And only 60, 60 years on, you've got this, you know, much more powerful machines on your desk um, to make music and so on. So we one wonder in only 10 years time, um, what, we, what these machines will be like. Um, and then of course, um, I think musicians uh, are not going to wait to see what will happen. I think it's time to, to engage with the developments and also perhaps influence the way in which you would like to see um, software development and hardware development um, uh, and how they would impact on, on in this in this industry. So, uh, what can quantum computing bring to music? Um, a number of things. I mean, a new paradigm for creativity. Um, you can only think, for example, before the digital computer, one hundred year ago, um, music was done in certain ways and. Today, it's composed and done in different ways, uh, which would not have been possible without the machine. So I, I believe that um, there will be, um, you know, beyond classical methods, so to speak, you know, um, of, of creating music with, um, with this new technology. And for, on a more pedestrian sort of uh, way, things that we can begin to envisage now, um, algorithm speed ups for tasks such as database search. Um, you know, companies like Spotify and, and Sony and all these uh, companies that have huge databases of music, uh, they don't really know how to search this database. They access 5% of what they have at most. That, you know, that's why you, you tend to hear the same tunes on the radio all the time. If you are in a classical music fan, for example, you hear all the same Mozart or Beethoven sonata all the time. It's because that's the easiest ones to access. So um, and there are other, other tasks like, you know, remixing music on the fly. Um, think of uh, applications where you may change the music as you listen to them and, and so on. And these are things that need speed. And, um, and this speed may be, um, afforded by, by new uh, quantum computing technologies. And, and I also think that um, music can contribute to computing um, research as it has been done in other fields of, of computer science. Um, in my lab, for example, we are looking into um, 
developing methods to listen to, to quantum information and uh, in algorithms. So um, the same way that uh, six years ago, those guys put the, that loudspeaker in the mainframe machine to listen to the programs compiling. Um, we are doing the same uh, today, um, listening to, um, you know, to uh, wave functions and, and things like that, that, which may help the design of circuits. Um, in the first, um, the first uses of, um, of com computers and music it was to compose, of course, um, and essentially the, the art of composing music with algorithms consists of uh, harnessing algorithms to produce patterns of data, because music is patterns of data, basically. And then um, uh, the art of composing with these, uh, with these machines and data is to develop ways to translate those patterns into musical forms. And, and this is what musicians have been doing all the time. Uh, before um, thinking in terms of music notation, writing little uh, uh, dots on, on scores and so on, this, how those patterns are translated into, into music. And the same thing happens today with, uh, with computer music. So we are all looking for ways in which patterns can be harnessed to compose music with. And these are some of the things that the computer, quantum computer music uh, community have been doing, um, including uh, work that we've been done um, developing my lab. So we, we recently developed a, a very simple five qubit circuit uh, that implements a, a quantum walk. And then um, the nodes of the, uh, of, of the walk are mapped into some sort of musical notes or musical rhythms. And as the algorithm goes around this um, hypothetic cube there, um, as it travels around the edges, uh, music is composed. Um, so this is one of the, the methods that we can apply uh, existing quantum computing resources right now to produce the, these kinds of, um, um, of applications, really. Um, let me talk a little bit now about the, um, the Qtune project, um, which is a project that is being um, funded um, um, with a generous uh, grant from the uh, Quantum Computing and Simulation Hub. Um, it is enabling us to try to create this um, uh, new emerging application for, for quantum computing. Um, we are looking into what is it that can be done now? What might be done in the future? Um, and uh, um, and the, what are the, uh, the areas of the music industry that um, this new technology um, will help to, to develop and perhaps solve problems that um, are unsolvable today. Um, but the main issue that um, we observed, um, especially um, amongst uh, my own colleagues in, in, in the music uh, field, um, we are witnessing the uh, development of quantum computing very rapidly, um, but musicians are not engaging with this, um, mostly because expertise is is confined to specialist research labs. Um, and exi existing tools for programming these machines are not adequate for, for, for musicians, for creators. And um, the learning curve is, is very steep. Um, uh, even with uh, tools like you know, Qiskit and, and the other uh, Python-based programming languages that are available today, um, it is not an easy thing, um, especially for professional musicians that are already very busy uh, taking care of other aspects of their profession and, and activity. So in this project, we want to, to develop uh, you know, uh, a set of tools uh, 
to our toolbox for musicians. And we call this a Q-Tune. So it's a bespoke programming languages, uh, bespoke tools, develop demonstrations, tutorials. So we want to create a quantum ready music tech community for you know, of early adopters. So when or as those machines become more available um, and more powerful, um, we will at the same time develop a, a community of enthusiasts, a community of early adopters that will um, be um, developing also the applications for, for, for music. Um, we've got uh, a project website, which I can show here, we've got, uh, you can have a look if you are interested. Um, we've got here um, already some of the uh, tools that we have been developing, um, a repository, and I will talk a little bit later on today about the conference that we are organizing around this, um, um, this area. So one of the uh, one of the prototypes that we are already uh, beginning to um, to test with um, with some musicians is a is a tool. Uh, it's called Quantum Computer Aided Composition System (QAQ), which is a um, we are embedding into a widely used music programming language the ability to to develop circuits and also to connect with, um, with the hardware. In this case, we are uh, connecting only with the IBM Q uh, hardware, but um, there are plans to connect to other uh, hardware as well. So Max is a widely used uh, programming language for, for musicians. Um, it's widely thought, um, um, taught in um, universities, colleges, all over the globe. It's a syntax that musicians understand. Basically you drag uh, blocks around a canvas and those blocks are um, uh, front ends for, uh, for commands, functions, and all sorts of things that you can do with audio and musical notes. And you, we are embedding here the ability to program um, um, circuits, circuits as well. Um, we will we'll soon publish uh, uh, a chapter um, in a book that I'm editing for uh, MIT Press on quantum computer music, and we'll feature this this work in this in this book. Eduardo, um, sorry, sorry, to interrupt one second. We have maybe other two minutes, and then we leave some some minutes for questions. Okay. Yeah. So this is my last slide, Fabio. Uh, this is my last slide. I just want to. Uh, to flag out this um, uh, new international symposium that we are organizing in, in November. Um, it will be uh, online and the, um, the website is there for uh, anyone who are interested in participating. And to finish, um, if you are interested in listening to a composition that was done with some of the tools that we developed in my laboratory, um, you are welcome to read an article that we published in Medium, and there are links to listen to examples there as well. Thank you. Okay, Fabio, thank I'm you. done. Th thank you so much, Eduardo. <laughs> Sorry for interrupting at the last. That's fine. Last I, I try. <laughs> I try to time these twenty minutes, but uh, it's so exciting that I keep talking more than I should sometimes. But so. <laughs> well, that's uh, that, that's definitely good, and I think it's uh, it's inspiring when someone is so so is so much passionate about uh, what is uh, researching or doing. Um, actually, this last uh, uh, slide uh, it perfectly bridge. Uh, for one of the questions that we had in the in the Q and A uh, section, right? It's uh, can you play a piece of your music? Uh, uh, okay. So the music that you composed or created with a quantum computer. Okay, so if you go, I'll, I'll share my screen again. Um, I'll share my screen again. Uh, where it is? Okay, there you go. There you go. So if you go to to this website here, uh, there is an article uh, I wrote for uh, 
medium, you know, it's a, this popular kind of uh, place for people to write articles about all sorts of things. I wrote one on the first application we wrote um, in, in a composition where I apply not only the algorithms that I designed, but also I give a hint of how thinking about quantum uh, inspired me to produce something musically that I would not have done if I had not thought in terms of quantum uh, computing. Um, and if you go, if I go back a little bit to um, to this here, if you go to this website here, um, there will be links um, coming with um, new things that we are developing, uh, including Jupyter notebooks with Python code that you can try um, yourself uh, and there will be links to compositions. And at the conference, um, we, will, um, um, we will show a lot of stuff as well from uh, creators all over there. It's very surprising the number of people who are interested in this. Um, so stay tuned uh, and join uh, and join the conference if you want to learn more. Then we have time for a last uh, question, which is, uh, um, what is the process that maps a node to a gate or vice versa? Are there examples of, of that? Or maybe if you can comment a bit more on the technical. Okay, what, what, we, what we do really um, is, uh, there, are, there are two things. One, one um, is to, the research I mentioned about listening to, to circuits. So we attach, um, we associate musical notes or, or rhythms or, or musical melodies and so on uh, to particular um, states that um, the waveform uh, uh, may, may assume. And then we, we listen to this. And as you change the, um, the, 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 the quantum states, you change the timbre of, of the sound. So that, that's one, one, one way of doing it. Um, but the approach that I, is more close to my heart, for example, um, is to actually composing with quantum computational uh, measurements. So we design a circuit, then we, we measure, take samples from, from the, uh, the quantum system, and then we transform those measurements into sounds or, or musical phrases. Um, and, and these are things that is a bit too technical to explain in just a couple of minutes. Um, but the uh, book chapter I mentioned in my slide earlier on gives you a hint of the methods that we've been developing to do this. Okay, perfect. So for people interested, they can check out uh, the, the book uh, that you recently released. Okay, thank you so much, Eduardo. It was very, a very interesting topic. Um, and now we move on to the last speaker of, uh, of this session on quantum computing. And we welcome Professor Dominique Zumbo uh, from, uh, from ETH Zurich. Uh, Professor Dominic Zumbold uh, is also director of the NCCR SPIN Center. Uh, he obtained his PhD at uh, Harvard University in 2004. Uh, then he continued with a uh, postdoc, uh, well, postdoc at MIT. In 2006, he became assistant professor in the University of Basel. Uh, in, in 2012, was promoted as associate professor, then uh, uh, became uh, a chair of the department uh, from 2015 and 2019. And, uh, and now he will talk here at this uh, conference, uh, this session about the uh, NCCR uh, SPIN Center. So welcome and thank you for, for joining us, Dominic. Uh, thanks very much, Fabio, for the kind introduction. And for the invitation to actually be part of this session, it's great to be here. I just put up the slides and maybe you can confirm if you're seeing the slides. We see the slides, but not in a presentation mode. All right. Let me swap it. How does they, that look? Perfect. Now it's perfect. All right. Thanks very much again for the introduction. Actually, uh, I did my undergrad at the ETH, but since uh, many years now, I'm working at the University of Basel just to comment on the, on the intro. But uh, thanks very much. And yeah, so today 
I will be talking about building small, fast, and also hot uh, spin, silicon spin qubits. And I will give you an introduction also of our new NCCR spin qubits in silicon, which has started just a little bit more than one year ago. Uh, in particular, I, I will present to you two slightly different types of qubits, which each have their own advantages and challenges. In particular, I will talk about the germanium silicon uh, nanowire whole spin qubit, as well as the silicon uh, fin field effect transistor FET whole spin qubit. So uh, already in today's session, you've seen quite a few different approaches to building qubits. And this is a slide from a couple of years ago from a science paper that gives some overview. And of course, there's superconducting qubits, trapped ions, and uh, silicon qubits and topological qubits and many more. Some of these even run at room temperature, uh, but I would like to ask about the size of these qubits and how fast they are. So uh, first of all, uh, silicon and uh, spin qubits in general in semiconductors, they can be made very small. And I, I come more to that in just a bit. And they can also run very fast at kind of uh, rates that are not so far from, from the rates, at, at clock rates of today's computers. Now, superconducting qubits and also trapped ions, they're of course much more advanced as you have seen in, in the media and maybe also today, but they're not so small and they're also not so fast in terms of their clock rate. There's some other interesting ideas around. In particular, I just want to touch upon uh, topological quantum computing very briefly. And of course there, there is very exciting new physics that's uh, also on the menu. And uh, this is about Majorana fermions and even more exotic uh, quasi particles, but it's yet not clear if these actually exist and what kind of coherence properties these would have, although they would be very promising. As I've mentioned, there is some great progress that was made. This is already two years old now, but it's still one of the more exciting developments from my perspective. And this is the quantum advantage that was demonstrated by Google's team with these 53 qubits uh, uh, two years ago. So, so they're, they're already uh, very far and they're connecting tens, if not hundreds of qubits soon. So if you just take a step back for a moment and think about how to build a quantum computer, then maybe you would be tempted to start with the famous uh, Di Vincenzo criteria, which are now over 20 years old. But of course, if you even if you check all of these, you don't yet quite have a scalable uh, full-fledged quantum computer. And so this is a more recent view by uh, Sholkopf and Devoray and others uh, from, from a few years ago. And this just shows that basically one of the keywords here is to have a logical qubit. So starting from single physical qubits, and algorithms one can do on these, one needs to actually start taking account for the errors and correct them to actually start building uh, logical qubits based on some surface code or some other uh, error correction scheme. And once one has that, then actually one can start running algorithms on multiple of these logical qubits and, and approach fault tolerant quantum computation. So that's kind of the far distance uh, goal. Now, if I just comment briefly on the quantum ecosystem, there is a number of uh, major companies and, and some of whom have uh, teamed up with some of the university teams. And of course, I've already mentioned Google who, who has worked together with Santa Barbara and others and also the IBM team who have been working on superconducting qubits. Microsoft together with Copenhagen, Delft and some other universities have been working on implementing the Majorana fermions on the topological qubits. Then there is a number of consortia, uh, for example, Intel with Delft or, or Letty, another semiconductor uh, foundry together with Grenoble and also in Sydney, there are some major teams working on uh, silicon spins. Now in Basel, together with the ETH and IBM here in Zurich, uh, we are working together on silicon spins since about a year ago in the framework of our new national Swiss program on, on silicon spins. So there's many more, this is just a very small section of it. Plus there is numerous startups and these are still growing and becoming more. So there are now roadmaps to a hundred maybe even more than a thousand qubits that, that you've probably heard about. 
But if you ultimately think about this, what we really need to go to is not a thousand qubits, but maybe a million or actually one billion qubits. And so if you look back at uh, the last uh, decades of what actually the semiconductor industry was doing, they have done an amazing job at actually interest integrating more than 10 billion transistors on a chip. So, so here, this is a, some, some chip that I got off the internet a photo of it and I mean on a basically on a one centimeter square die you can fit, fit more than 10 billion transistors for example on some few nanometer uh, technology with uh, fin, uh, field effect transistors you get hundreds of watt of dissipation one of the main limiting factors of this technology they're running at the two or more gigahertz of speeds and the cost of these uh, of these uh, chips comes at hundreds of francs per, per pop. So that's fairly cheap. So there's a number of in, uh, semiconductor manufacturers that have gone in this direction. And of course, this is not you know, grown out of nothing. As I said, it took many decades and, and lots of scaling following Moore's law over the past two decades. So, so that's the basic idea to basically take this already existing uh, fantastic uh, properties of the si si silicon and scaled semiconductors to turn the classic bits in some way into quantum bits. So uh, in the NCCR spin, this is uh, the goal to develop a spin-based quantum computer in silicon or germanium uh, in these materials. And the main objective will be develop a fast, a compact and scalable electron and hole spin qubits. So there's a th primarily three types of different qubits, electron spin qubits, that we try to pursue as well as whole spin qubits two different kind of uh, whole spin qubits. I'll, I'll come to talk about them in a bit more detail. Plus there is also an important task on architectures where we look at the scalability, how to couple different qubits to each other, how to integrate uh, qubit control electronics on chip together either with the qubits at the same temperature or at some intermediate temperature stage inside the cryostat and of course work on error correction and also algorithms is part of this architecture package. So this is an interdisciplinary team that uh, joins together quantum physicists together with material scientists, engineers and also computer scientists. So our Swiss network, as I said here, consists of partners at the ETH in Zurich, at the EPF in Lausanne and also University of Basel, which is serving as the home institution. And last but not least, our important industrial partner at IBM Zurich. So uh, in the next few minutes, I would like to show some of the advantages and progress that we have made in, in two of our uh, types of qubits that we are uh, working on. And first, I would like to discuss the nanowire whole spin qubits in these core shell germanium silicon nanowires which uh, have turned out to be extremely fast and uh, controllable with the gate voltage and also the, the whole spin qubits in silicon finfets, which already operate at very high temperatures above four Kelvin. So whole spin qubits, uh, there's some interesting things uh, and, and the reasons that speak for whole spin qubits. In particular, there is the spin orbit interaction in the valence band there is uh, an angular momentum L equals one, which intrinsically makes available much more strong spin orbit coupling than is available for electrons. And then this opens the doors to actually uh, fast and efficient all electrical manipulation of these qubits. Uh, moreover, holes uh, in the valence band are built up from P-type wave functions. And so due to their p-type nature, the overlap at the uh, silicon atom itself or the germanium atom itself is actually zero. And this leads to the absence of the contact Fermi hyperfine interaction. And one could extrapolate from this that this leads to longer coherence. Now, I should also mention already that there's a price to pay also for this electrical uh, capability to manipulate. And in fact, the spin orbit coupling, it couples the spins to the orbits, to the electric fields and to the charges. And this can also couple noise to the qubits. So the price that we pay is maybe a little bit of coherence or in some cases, a lot of loss of coherence. I'd like to also thank uh, Leon for providing some of these slides. So in holes, actually now uh, starting now to confine them in a kind of a quasi one-dimensional geometry where we have a transverse confinement in two directions that's very strong. 
uh, together with a longitudinal confinement that's a little bit weaker. In this situation, our theory colleagues uh, have already years ago uh, thought about this and actually have predicted a very strong and fully electrically tunable type of spin orbit coupling, which they term direct Rajpa spin orbit coupling. So in this type of setup, actually the heavy hole and light hole bands start to mix and these states uh, create a very strong spin orbit coupling. It's very similar to the kind of usual type of Rajpa spin orbit coupling, but the usual Rajpa actually has uh, the band gap here, which uh, kind of normalizes it or divides it in the denominator and the band gaps of semiconductors are typically of order of electron volts. So this is very much suppressed. And it turns out now for this situation in this uh, quasi one dimensional holes, the, the quantity which now divides it because we're already directly in the, in the, in the valence band, no more indirect transitions need, need to be done. And the quantity that shows up here is the subband spacing. So that's the kind of longitudinal energy scale, which is of order of tens or 20 of milli electron volts. So it's orders of magnitude a weaker um, uh, division here. And so this makes this direct rush per term very, very strong. And so as a consequence of this actually ultra strong uh, qubit manipulation was predicted even reaching up to and above the gigahertz frequency range. Uh, but not only does this make the qubits fast, it was also predicted by theory that this leads to very strong electric field dependence of other key parameters of the qubits. For example, the G factor, basically that's the qubit energy, um, is also controlled with electric fields. And this could be a very useful property in particular also for scaling. So with this uh, G factor tunability, one could bring uh, a spin qubit into and out of resonance with a resonator, a, a superconducting microwave resonator, for example, to couple it to other qubits or to uncouple it. Moreover, also the spin orbit coupling strength itself would depend on uh, properties like the electric field through the gate voltage uh, applied to the nanostructures. And this uh, would allow us to actually control the, the qubit speed. One could go to a kind of slow um, uh, energy uh, information storage position where the um, spin orbit coupling is weak for some gate voltage and one could switch it to become fast by changing just an electric field. So those are the basic premises and these apply to uh, fundamentally similarly to both of these types of qubits. And I'll first discuss to some extent the germanium silicon uh, core shell whole spin qubits. I would like to uh, acknowledge and thank my wonderful team, uh, both at uh, the University of Basel, but also I'd like to thank Eric Buckers and his team for growing these nanowires. We also started growing now our own wires with the group of Ilaria Zardo, but that's uh, to come in the future. So basically these samples, uh, they consist of this uh, core shell nanowire. There's a germanium core here in the center. This is a temp picture. These uh, cores are extremely small. Here in this picture, it's just about 10 nanometers. And there is a shell that's made from silicon. And this is also very thin. It's usually two to three nanometers in, in thickness. And this uh, silicon shell actually exerts uh, a strain on the system and actually lifts the degeneracy uh, in, in the ground states. What's really uh, exciting also about this particular type of qubit is that there is a pinning of the chemical potential inside the valence band. So here, this uh, dashed uh, line here is, is the Fermi energy. And without having to apply any doping or any uh, additional gate voltages, we can already have these uh, 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 quasi 1D wires populated with a whole gas. So now if we put some uh, uh, gate voltage uh, array underneath it, cover it with an oxide, we put the wire on top with a micro manipulator and then add the contacts, then one can actually run these systems in depletion mode and actually operate them electrically with these gate voltages. So for example, here with these five gates, one can use the leftmost and the rightmost as well as the middle gate as to control the tunnel barriers and kind of localize holes uh, on the left and on the right dot, which can be uh, shifted in energy with these uh, gates two and four. In principle, of course, this is not a very scalable approach, but there are uh, initiatives and ideas for templated growth of these uh, at controlled locations. And with that also, they could be integrated with conventional fabrication. So now to actually manipulate this, as I've said, 
uh, we want to do this all electrically. So we're not going to create any time dependent magnetic field. We only use electric fields. And the idea is here to basically apply on one of the gates. In this case, it's the leftmost here, a microwave signal that's in resonance uh, with the Zeeman splitting with the qubit energy. And if we do this, this actually has the effect to shake the holes along the nanowire back and forth. And in this way, we basically can create an effective time dependent magnetic field through the spin orbit coupling. So basically the motion of these holes together with the electric fields they create through this Rajpa spin orbit coupling, a time dependent magnetic field. And this needs to spin resonance. And this is what we see here. This is the kind of classic uh, spin resonance condition that's shown here. And uh, it's basically driving one of the two hole spins uh, from up to down and vice versa. And this can be done coherently. And I, I will skip the details here, but we can go basically and demonstrate uh, coherent control and universal control with both axes in this way. So is this really the kind of driving that, that I have promised? And we can check this uh, for this type of electric dipole spin resonance, EDSR. It is expected that the uh, Rabi frequency, the speed at which we can process these spins is proportional to the magnetic field as well as the applied microwave signal. And we can check both of these uh, uh, in the experiment quite nicely. Moreover, at the highest speeds here, we see that we reach Rabi frequencies of around 436 megahertz. That's very fast. That's basically spending just around one nanosecond to coherently flip a spin from up to down and vice versa. And actually calibrating the microwave power from this, we can also extract that the spin orbit length is around four nanometers. Uh, this is actually a amazingly short spin orbit length compared to many other materials. Uh, this spin orbit length, for example, in indium arsenide is typically 100 nanometers. In gallium arsenide, it would be 10 microns or a few microns. So this is uh, extremely strong spin orbit coupling. And this is a kind of in agreement with what, the, what was predicted by theory. Moreover, by changing another gate voltage, in this particular case, now we're actually controlling this middle gate voltage, we can also change the energy of the qubit or the G factor. So here, by adjusting this middle gate by something like 30, 35 millivolts, we are shifting the G factor by about 50%. It goes from 0 0.2 all the way up to 1.2. And so uh, together with this change of the G factor, also the speed of the qubit is changing. This is changing by about the factor of seven over the same gate voltage range. And you can see on the Rabi oscillation spotted on the bottom left here that they go from quite slow to quite fast here on the, on the axis, we have tens of nanoseconds. And uh, finally, I need to also show you the coherence. Of course, it would be ideal if this uh, increased speed uh, could be done without paying for it with any coherence, but unfortunately this is not the case so far in the experiments. And what we see is that the T2 Rabi time, so that's just the damping of these Rabi oscillations, drops by about the same factor as the speed goes up. So in fact, this is not completely unexpected, uh, as I mentioned already in the intro slide to this uh, direct rush bus spin orbit coupling. If we increase the spin orbit coupling strength, we also uh, open the door for coupling to noise. And this seems to be the case here. And, and the suspicion is that we're coupling to uh, electric noise uh, from, from the oxides or the interfaces. So this has demonstrated a kind of a spin orbit switch where we can control some of the key qubit parameters with gate voltages. So uh, with that said, I would like to close here on this type of qubit and in the last few minutes also switch uh, to the other type of qubits with an outlook we are working to improve the coherence and try to kind of improve the oxides and also the nanowires themselves. We're working on coupling these to, uh, to do uh, single shot readouts. So far this was long averaging. We want to couple these spins to uh, superconducting resonators, both with the squid arrays in collaboration with the Walroff group at the EPH, but also with niobium titanium nitrate resonators with the Schoenberg group in Basel and scale to more qubits and also work um, machine learning techniques for tuning. Actually, these two qubits leave a lot of room for tuning. And I think machine learning is a great approach for this. And there is work that's already underway in collaboration with Natalia Ares group at Oxford. So now finally turning to the, to the fin, uh, field effect transistor devices, 
the, the principle there of operation is very similar. The devices are quite a bit different. So these are kind of FinFET devices. And these pictures uh, here are uh, taken from this applied physics letters from a couple of years ago. And in principle, we have a FinFET, uh, a fin that's going along this horizontal dashed line here. There is a cross section that we've taken with a 10 on the left side. And this shows that these fins are just a few nanometers, maybe five to 10 nanometers wide on top. And uh, we put gates over them transversal to the fin direction. And with this, we can actually start to form a double quantum dot and start to operate qubits. Also here, I would like to acknowledge my team. Uh, importantly, this is a collaboration together with IBM in Zurich and the devices were fabricated there. And we are uh, looking forward to further collaborations on the system. So we can go to kind of few holes, we can go to spin blockades and do the same kind of readout as before. We apply the microwaves to one of these gates and again can kind of operate in the same type of cycle as before these qubits and control them. But what's now amazing here, and this has really come to a surprise to us, we did not quite expect this, although we hoped for it, is that the coherence of these systems is really quite nice. So here, you see uh, a Rabi oscillation. Uh, I think it's over 40 oscillations that you see here. And uh, unfortunately, we cannot measure for any longer because basically we're running out of uh, resolution on the signal. These are very, very small currents that we're measuring on the scale of femtoamps. And so we can see this uh, oscillation here of the, of the qubit. Now to actually make such measurements, and since it's the quantum industry day, let me also point out that uh, we have a spin-off uh, Basel Precision Instruments that produces uh, uh, excellent uh, amplifiers and also voltage sources, new now with the even more channels and very, very low noise. Now, these qubits are also uh, gate controllable, but to a smaller ex amount uh, extent than the, the germanium silicon nanowires. But we estimate that if we actually rotate and take the fin along the 001 direction, we can gain another factor of 10 to 15 of the spin orbit strength. So um, we can now investigate the coherence a bit more. So far, we've just looked at the T2 Rabi that was very long, but uh, doing Ramsey fringes, it turns out that the T2 times that we measure are in the hundreds of nanoseconds. And I would like to point out that all of this is done already at fairly high temperatures. So these measurements that I've shown so far were done basically at uh, 1.5 Kelvin in a variable temperature insert, so not in a dilution refrigerator. This has huge advantages because obviously the cooling power is very large at these higher temperatures. It becomes a order of watts uh, uh, at four Kelvin or above and you can just simply pump helium. And this makes it possible to actually integrate the qubits together with the qubit control uh, uh, hardware in kind of cryomos chips uh, at low temperatures. So this uh, makes, uh, oblivious, uh, these like hundreds of coaxes that in the future might go down in a fridge, you can basically integrate this um, chip. Now, if you look at the performance of these holes, it's actually already quite respectable. We're getting a single gate fidelities around 99%, which is basically at the fault tolerance threshold. And uh, yeah, the coherence times go up to 440 nanoseconds. As I've said, we can do echo. We can do more uh, elaborate echo with this uh, CPMG sequences and we get in the microseconds of coherence times. So overall, these uh, qubits in silicon fin fits are already at a very coherent and uh, highly uh, flexible mode of operation all with electrical field. So this gives you a comparison that plots uh, the kind of the Q, uh, the quality factor telling you what the T2 star is in relation to the operation time uh, of doing a 180 degree rotation. And already we're uh, comparing this uh, silicon fin fed qubit very favorably, even to many qubits uh, who are running at uh, dilution refrigerated temperatures. And I think I will skip this uh, slide because I've already mentioned the, the speed of these qubits. And I will just summarize again that uh, with the uh, silicon fin fed qubits, the coherence is very good. We can operate them all electrically up to 150 megahertz operation speeds, and we're already at the fault tolerance threshold. So in the future, we would like to turn on some exchange. This should be possible with a gate voltage, go towards uh, two qubit gates, and also work on a single shot readout of, the, of these. We, we would like to try this uh, stronger spin orbit direction, as I've mentioned, with the fin 
uh, along the 110 direction. And uh, we're also looking at going to larger number of qubits. And with this, I'm now at the end of my slides. I hope I didn't go too much over. And I would like to thank all of you for your attention. And I'll be very happy to take some questions. Thank you very much, Dominic. It was very interesting to see also this other uh, technology and uh, how uh, the, the, lat the latest progress. Um, we have time maybe for a very uh, short couple of questions. I think one is technical and is about uh, um, the uh, platform itself. So the aluminum and titanium metal oxide suffer, suffer a form of memory or drift through the surface oxide. How to manage this? Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, the oxides are absolutely critical uh, and also the interfaces that could be uh, disordered, they could be charge traps that are in there and how to manage that is something that we're still on a learning curve. So we started looking also at the capacitance spectroscopy. We can do this at room temperature for first characterizations. We can also try to do this at low temperatures. And we are taking the kind of approach that also is well known in the industry of annealing uh, at different temperatures in different gas compositions to improve uh, on these types of uh, oxides that are a key component of these qubits. Thank you. Uh, and then we have another, another quick question. Uh, this is more about since we are talking about an industry day in Switzerland. So it's, uh, the question is about the ecosystem and what is unique about this Swiss consortium you're representing with the NCCR SPIN Center compared to the others you mentioned? The well, you have seen that our approach, I, I have another overview slide, but we are, uh, for, for example, the two projects that I presented now here are primarily focused on holes and in these kind of uh, highly scalable fin-fed architectures, of course, we haven't demonstrated scaling. That's something we have to work on in the future, but it's at least plausible that we can fit many of these qubits on a chip. I mean, that's already been done. The question is what will the coherence be and how can we link many qubits together? So, so here I, I would say this, uh, this combination of uh, the, the industry expertise that lies with the IBM and the kind of physics uh, background and expertise both on the theory as well as on the experiments that we bring on the other nodes from the academic partners, I think is maybe the unique uh, selling point compared to some of the other consortia. But there's indeed also overlap, it's, it's also true. I mean, that's, that's, I think it's always true or at least it's partially true for many consortia and projects. Um, but there is clearly a, a uniqueness here. Um, so thank you so much for uh, for your talk, for uh, for joining this this session. And I apologize for my mistake at the beginning when I when I read your your <laughs> biography. And clearly, I mentioned that you became professor at the University of Basel. So it was uh, was my bad saying uh, uh, contradicting myself. Uh, um, so I apologize for that, but I think most of the audience uh, here knows you very well, uh, uh, so it doesn't need my, my short presentation. So thank you so much, Dominic, for joining the session, and thank you for all the speakers that have uh, joined us in this uh, last se in this session, see you about quantum computing. We have learned a lot of, uh, uh, we had a, actually a very uh, broad overview of this field. Uh, we have seen uh, uh, the technology roadmap uh, in, in Germany. We have seen uh, two different technologies, the trapped ions, the spin qubits. Uh, we have learned about uh, how to the quantum computing applications uh, in the field of machine learning and uh, finance. Uh, we have learned uh, uh, how to use quantum uh, quantum computing, but also quantum games for bridging academia, society. We have learned also new form of uh, uh, research or new line of research, which are in, in, this, in the specific sense, uh, quantum music. So I think it was very insightful and really thanks a lot to all the speakers from, uh, from uh, our side as a host. Here we have Mira, which appears again, who appears again on the screen. So we really want to thank you. So thank you from myself and last word for Mira. Thank you also from my side for these excellent contributions, the excellent questions and really a fascinating session.
Thank you, Thank you. Ole. And uh, for people that are uh, for, uh, based in Zurich, uh, we are hosting an in-person apero in about 20 minutes. So in case you are here, uh, we will see each other later. Other than that, have a nice evening. And uh, if you're interested in learning about quantum computing with Qiskit, tomorrow we have a workshop. We have organized a workshop from five to seven. Uh, and James Wooten will, uh, will teach you more about uh, quantum computing at IBM with Qiskit. Thank you, everyone, Thank you. and uh, have a nice okay. evening. Thank you.